Great. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending today's hearing. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals. And first, I want to acknowledge my colleague and favorite, I mean fellow member of the committee, Diana Ayala. Today, we will address safe staffing practices in hospitals and hear resolution number 396, sponsored by Council Member Cabrera, calling on the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign the safe staff. Safe Staffing for Quality Care Act. That might happen again today, but. In addition, we will hear introduction numbers 1351 and 1352 and resolution number 723 sponsored by council member Jonai regarding emergency room wait times and a campaign to educate residents about the services offered at different emergency care facilities. Representatives from Health and Hospitals, the New York State Nurses Association, NISNA, and members of the public will provide testimony today. Although our city hospitals are consistently recognized as some of the highest quality establishments in the nation, there are serious concerns that nurses and other direct care staff are tasked with excessive workloads. Multiple studies have found that excessive workloads can not only increase instances of burnout for nurses, but also increase adverse patient outcomes. Nurses in New York are not alone. Nurses across the country are advocating to implement safe staffing standards, and California and Massachusetts have both implemented laws to require specific nurse-to-patient ratios. New York State has not implemented any strict nurse-to-patient or direct care worker-to-patient ratio requirement. State regulations currently require hospitals to have a director of nursing services who is responsible for, and I quote, developing a plan to be approved by the hospital for determining the types and numbers of nursing personnel and staff necessary to provide nursing care for all areas of the hospital. While there are members of the healthcare system who believe it is the best pra practice to have hospitals decide the best ratios for their individual systems, a discussion around standardization seems necessary. According to some reports, there are nurses in New York City who are treating up to 15 patients at a time. Regardless of where one's perspective lies, this is a dangerous situation which must be addressed. I look forward to discussing different potential ratios and learning more about how staffing requirements are developed. Collectively, researchers have been unable to decisively conclude what the most optimal nurse-to-patient ratios are, and individual organizations and other state governments have implemented their own ideal minimums. For example, NISNA nurse-to-patient ratios range from one-to-one -one in the trauma emergency unit to one-to-six in the well baby nursery. During today's hearing, I hope to dig into best practices as well as examine all the potential next steps available to our healthcare providers. As a committee and as a council, we must prioritize the health of all New Yorkers, including patients, nurses, and direct care workers. It is unacceptable to have nurses and direct care workers so overburdened with work that they feel it is a danger to themselves and those that they dedicate their lives to serving. The attainment of high quality care for New Yorkers and the protection of the employers who make that possible is of utmost importance to me and I look forward to hearing testimony regarding this important issue. I want to uh, recognize my colleague, Council Member Matthew Eugene, and I also want to read, oh, and Reynoso, hi. I also want to read something uh, really briefly from Council Member Cabrera. He asked me to read this opening statement on Reso 396, which is the safe staffing for quality care. He says, good afternoon to everyone. Reso 396 calls on the state to pass the Safe Staffing for Quality Care Act to ensure that acute care facilities and nursing homes use appropriate staffing for nurses and unlicensed direct care staff. HHS data shows that inadequate nursing staff levels can lead to poor patient outcomes. Studies indicate that higher nursing workloads are associated with increased medication errors, rates of infection, and mortality. Reducing nursing workloads and adopting minimum staffing requirements leads to better patient care, better outcomes, and improve quality of life for nurses based on better work conditions. If enacted into law, the Safe Staffing for Quality Care Act would enable RNs to refuse work assignments if staffing is inadequate. Ensuring adequate nursing coverage for all patients and safe and reasonable working conditions for nurses are important public health goals. Thank you for your consideration of this legislation. 
So with that, I would love to call up Dr. Mitchell Katz from Health and Hospitals and, and Natalia Sineas. Did I say that correctly, Natalia? Okay. We have some fans here, Dr. Katz. Just going to have you sworn in. You would you like to say something after uh, after they? Okay. Is there anyone from DOH MH here uh, to answer questions? If so, we could swear them in. Is there anyone from DOH MH that wants to say anything? I mean, that want, that can be in the panel in order to answer questions. We can swear you in. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Rivera and members of the committee. Health hospitals. I'm Dr. Mitch Katz, the president and CEO. Thank you. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of the New York City Health and Hospitals. So I'm. Uh, delighted to be here, and I want to thank the chair and the other committee members for having this hearing and for bringing to light the importance of nurses throughout uh, our hospitals. I'm also very happy to be joined by Natalia Sineas, who is a doctor of nursing um, and a respected leader and care provider, and like our chair, was born in a New York City hospital. Um, in the case of our chair, it was Bellevue. In the case of our uh, new nurse leader, it was Kings County. Um, at Health and Hospitals, nurses are the heart of our mission to deliver high-quality, compassionate care for all New Yorkers, from our emergency departments to our skilled nursing facilities to the neonatal ICU. Nurses are essential caregivers. They not only offer top quality care, but they help patients to navigate a complex health system, which is particularly important for low-income people who have fewer other supports and who have greater uh, social needs. I've learned a lot in my first year and a half back in New York from our nurses. Uh, I've learned that it took far too long to recruit nurses and that it used to be at health and hospitals that recruitment um, did not even begin until a nurse actually left her position, which meant guaranteed that we would be short staffing because a nurse would have to leave before we would even start the possibility of recruiting. Uh, that has now been changed. As soon as we know that somebody is leaving, we immediately open the position. And we actually, for the first time now, have nurses in training who are set for positions that have not yet vacated. But we know that there's always going to be a certain amount of turnover. And so we want to um, make it easier to, to always be fully staffed. Uh, we do an amazing job training with new nurses. And we have incredibly dedicated career nurses. But I note as a major problem for us to work collaboratively with NISNA on is that we often lose early career nurses to private health systems. The basic issue is that we hire nurses uh, out of school. We give them the best training they could possibly get at places like Bellevue or Jacoby or Harlem. And then after two years, they are incredibly experienced, capable nurses who've worked under the most difficult conditions. And so they're incredibly uh, sought after by other health systems, which pay more. Um, and I'd say that's not a very good business model because it's very expensive to train a nurse, right? Uh, a nurse out of school really needs six months to be at the level that he or she can perform as a fully capable nurse. And so um, by not adjusting our salaries appropriately so that nurses by year three to five are getting paid appropriate wages, all that's happening is we're, we're serving as a very effective training uh, ground. And I'm sure the other hospitals greatly appreciate us. Um, but it's not, from my point of view, a very good um, business model. Um, we have uh, taken a number of steps to uh, deal with our challenges. I'm very pleased that even though the organization that I inherited had a $1.8 billion 
deficit after hearing directly from nurses, and this occurred at our public hearing, where they got up. They were the ones who said, you know, Dr. Katz, you have to do something about our staffing. We are way too low. We made a commitment, despite the budget crisis and the hiring freeze, to hire net 340 new nurses. So that's taking into account retirements, leaves, other places people went. We filled the, we backfilled all of those, and then we hired uh, 340 nurses. We also previously had no standard staffing plans. So all nurse units were set at whatever they historically were, or however many nurses they had. Uh, uh, Dr. Sinea's predecessor, uh, uh, Dr. Mendez, uh, did the first nurse staffing plans, which uh, Dr. Sinea's is maintaining, um, so that now we have uh, for the first time, appropriate staffing levels at our uh, different uh, units. We've reduced paperwork so that we can hire nurses faster, and we've launched a re recruiting campaign, which as far as I know is the first uh, recent recruiting campaign uh, that Health and Hospitals has, and appropriately, as we did with our doctor campaign, it focuses on mission. Right? We want people to come to us for mission. Um, that is the most important reason to work at health and hospitals because you get to take care of people who otherwise would not get cared for. Uh, our contract negotiations began uh, with NISNA uh, earlier this month. We have a great relationship with them and we're looking forward to working with them on what we see as a common purpose. We don't see ourselves as having a different agenda as NISNA, we see ourselves as having the same agenda of NISNA, which is to make sure that we continue to recruit great nurses, that we have uh, safe staffing, um, that uh, our nurses want to stay with us. We feel if you stay with us uh, two or three years, you will so fall in love with health and hospitals that it will be impossible uh, for you to work anywhere else. Uh, we need to work with NISNA around specialty nursing care. Um, although, uh, without question, nurses across our system do amazing work. Uh, nurses in specialty areas in other hospitals do earn higher salaries. Uh, so nurses in the private sector who work in the ED, in the ICU, in the NICU have higher salaries. Um, and if we're going to continue to be able to retain the best nurses, we need to be able to uh, pay rates that are at least comparable. And it's the same as with physicians. I don't need the highest salaries across the city. I need salaries that, when combined with our mission, keep the best nurses. Um, I, I know uh, related to nurse staffing that uh, members are concerned about wait times in the emergency department, and that is uh, a very uh, real concern. It is, I'd say, a complicated issue. Uh, this is not a New York-specific issue. Uh, wait times uh, and crowding in emergency departments is uh, occurring across the U.S. Uh, there are more emergency visits in this past year in the U.S. than in any other year uh, previously, and it keeps growing. Uh, I do think it's important that people understand that emergency departments are about triage. So no matter how long the average wait is, if you come to our emergency department or any credible emergency department with substernal chest pain or trauma, you're going to go right in. In fact, uh, all emergency rooms are based on a one to five triage sc uh, scale. This is across the nation. One and two means you're going directly in. Three are people who may be seriously sick or may be able to be discharged. And four and five are people who have problems that could be seen in, an, in a primary care setting but are coming to an emergency department. So really what wait times uh, uh, cause is very long waits for people who are at levels three, four, and five, especially if there are a lot of ones and twos coming in. And it, it also causes frustration because people are like, well, I've been waiting and that person just came right in. But that person came right in because they turned out to have substernal chest pain or signs of a stroke. And so the, the more people who are critically ill, the longer the other people are going to wind up waiting. That's not meant as an excuse. That's meant at least to reassure people 
that across the nation, emergency rooms are set for triage. But we do need to wait, uh, need to shorten waits for people who are coming for, uh, for example, problems in the three area can be a serious headache, can be serious abdominal pain. So the, these are not trivial issues. This is not, you know, uh, a runny nose that we're talking about. And having to wait hours and hours um, while you have abdominal pain is a problem. Uh, nurse staffing is one factor in wait times, um, but it's certainly not the only factor. And if we're going to improve the situation, we're going to have to work on all of the different issues that affect emergency room waits. Uh, we have 9,600 full and part-time nurses uh, at health and hospitals. Um, my commitment to safe staffing is absolute. Uh, my elderly parents, my husband and I all receive care at health and hospitals, and my daughter will as well when she arrives in July. And I certainly wouldn't have my family be seen in a place that I didn't believe was safe. And I will not operate facilities that are not safe. Um, I want to continue to hear from nurses about how we improve our care. Uh, I'm very happy with the relationship that we have with NISNA. I see them as our partners in making things better, and I, I look forward to hearing more uh, guidance and, uh, and uh, leadership uh, suggestions from the City Council and working with all of you uh, and the great nurses in my system. Thank you. Is anyone else going to testify? Okay. I think, I think Dr. Sinea says you have questions. I right. uh, um, will answer many of the more technical aspects yeah. of our nursing. Great. And Dr. Katz, I, I agree. I, I want to, I think we've worked well together. We want to be very supportive. I, I try to show up to all the things that you're doing in the health and hospital system, whether it's uh, a pride center or whether it's disgusting how public charge could affect the very culture and nature of how people come into the hospital. And um, I am interested, though, to know specifically um, your thoughts, H&H's thoughts, the city's feelings on the legislation before you today. You mentioned safe staffing as being important, and you mentioned um, emergency department wait times. But you didn't say whether or not you, uh, I guess, approve or, unless it's somewhere in here, whether you support or oppose the legislation? Uh, right. So uh, personally, I support the legislation. I support safe staffing. Um, the, what the exact legislation says and how it affects our negotiations with NISNA is, from my point of view, to come. Right. The, the legislation certainly has implications, uh, financial implications for the city and affects our contract with NISNA. Mm -hmm. So I see it as something we would do together. I, I see the first year and a half as going from a place where we didn't even have staffing ratios of any kind. Um, and we didn't have, and we clearly had, you know, ratios that weren't anywhere near what the legislation currently re requests. Uh, but I, I think safe staffing is clearly the right thing to do. Okay. Um, well, so, so let's talk a little bit about the, the legislation before us and um, a couple things that you mentioned. Do you want to say something before you go? Yeah. Okay. Before, before I get into questions, I want to just recognize Council Member uh, Matthew Eugene, um, our resident physician in the Council. And I know you wanted to make a few remarks, ask a couple yes, questions. Yes, thank you very much. I, I'm going to be very brief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, um, Commissioner, I want to thank you for the effort that you are doing to uh, correct this situation. This is well overdue. And uh, I think that uh, when we talk about safe staffing for nurses, we shouldn't have to discuss, to debate, to fight. We have been fighting for so long, so long. Since, but uh, my question, you don't have to answer it now because unfortunately I haven't, I got, I got a doctor appointment, I got to go. But uh, I'm asking if at this time, as we speak, did we feel the gap? Are we in the situation to say, yes, we will we, we reach the ratio, the necessary ratio for nurses and patients, in order to make the life of our patients safe, in order to, to do justice to the nurses? It is about, you know, being fair to the nurses, being fair to the uh, to the patient, 
not about the, 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 the safety of the patient. We are all human beings. It doesn't matter how intelligent, how dedicated you are. At a certain time, your body say, listen, you got to stop. You got to stop. We know that brilliant doctors, cardiologists, they got heart attack, you know. They become sick also because it is not easy. Being a doctor, being a nurse, it is not easy. This is a very heavy job. So I'm, I think that you mentioned that something about the financial implication for the city, but half of the people doesn't have a price. When we're talking about the health of the people in New York City, we are obligated, we elected officials, you from HHC, to do everything that we can do to ensure that the patient, the New Yorkers, the hardworking people, when they are in the hospital, they are in the position to receive the proper, the state of the art, you know, our medical care, but the staff that is providing the services for them and the position also to continue to deliver the best services possible. So if we don't have, if we don't do our responsibility to hire the number of necessary nurses to do the job, I don't think that we are do, making justice to the patient. One of the things that uh, you mentioned that, and I have been seeing that, we replace the nurses when there's a, 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 a position vacant. But we gotta be prepared. Before that, some of the time the nurses, they are not trained properly. They, they have to spend some time to be trained to respond to that responsibility. We need qualified and trained nurses. Even, we don't have to wait when a nurse, you know, uh, is a force to leave, or regardless of the situation, to replace the nurse. But we gotta make sure we got the necessary number of nurses to do the job. And again, I applaud what you are doing, but I hope that we won't have, next time to go to on the step of city wall, we, don't, we won't have to go, you know, uh, in the street to rally and to protest, to fight, you know, for the nurses. I think it is a moral obligation to do. As the chair said, we, city council members, we are willing to work together with you, with the administration, to ensure that we correct that. We have to do it. It's an obligation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. And to the wonderful nurses uh, who are there day and night, I know that, I said that before, we said the city never sleep. I know you never sleep. You don't sleep also. You know, you, you know, you don't sleep. When I say you don't sleep because the nurses, they are there 24-7. So, of course, you got to sleep. But 24-7, we have the nurses taking care of the patient. Thank you for what you're doing for our constituents. And thank you. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I guess there's a difference in getting sleep and running on adrenaline, right, and wanting to make sure that you are of sound mind and body. I know it's physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually draining, and uh, we want to make sure that we are uh, creating and improving a system that I think is already, it's not just the largest one in the, in the country, but it is world class in many, many ways, and people come from all over and receive amazing quality health care. For Do Dr. Katz specifically, you were the, the director of the Los Angeles County Health Agency and a pr practicing physician in the state of California. Um, I know you're back in New York and, and you're glad that you're here. They've implemented regulated nurse to patient ratios. And what was your experience implementing these ratios? It was in California, there was a lot of protest uh, before the ratios got passed, just as there's been in New York. Uh, my experience of doing it was very positive. Uh, I mean, uh, you have to be able to recruit the nurses. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why I reflect that no matter what, solving this problem requires a close collaboration between us, NISNA, and the city. At this moment, my biggest problem is recruiting and keeping nurses. It isn't actually the number, right? I mean, if, if you put before me 30 great nurses, I'm, I'll hire them, right? So right at the moment in places where I have a ratio uh, on paper, I can't meet the ratio because I can't hire 30 great nurses. So that's part of why, and, and that's especially true again in the 
in the areas that require specialized skills, uh, ORs, NICUs, emergency rooms, which is some of the places we run the lowest. So it, it, to fix this, we have to fix all of the different parts. But, but overall, I would say the experience of California proved that no, it does not bankrupt all the hospitals and they don't all close. I don't, I'm not aware that there were any hospital closures in California over nurse ratios. Um, and that it is attainable, you do have to be able to recruit the nurses, right? Uh, no matter what your quote-unquote mandatory staffing is, if you don't have the nurses, you can't meet the ratio. And do you think it improved the overall experience? I think there's, there's very strong data that the number, that the more nurses per group of patients, the better the outcomes. I don't think anybody disputes that. I appreciate what you said about um, bankrupting hospitals and that kind of not being a factor considering. So you said that you've hired 340 net new nurses and the breakdown, well, what you gave us was 9,600 full and part-time nurses. Does the 9,600 include the 340? Yes. And do you know what's the breakdown between full and part-time? I don't. Do you? I don't. The 9,000. We, we'd be happy to okay. yeah. provide that. Yeah. How are... I know you have nurses for NYC, mm -hmm. and that's your recruiting effort. How are the efforts going? It's going really well. Within the first week, I received an email from HR. We, we set up a call, and we had 80 resumes. So it's really working. We focused on correctional health, the emergency department, ambulatory care, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. And when you mention those that are coming in to see to, to receive care. Some of it, you mentioned the one to five scale, one, one to two being the most dire when someone absolutely needs to be seen. How are you, and this goes to some of the legislation before us today, how, how are campaigns out there educating people as to when to know when a runny nose or a four sure. or a five is something that you could actually go see your, P, your primary care physician for, or even with the new urgent cares that you have that you're rolling out at the health, the health and hospital facilities? Sure. Well, I think that's a really insightful question uh, because it's at all levels. So, for example, just to start at the opposite level that you did, there's now really compelling medical research that you can do something about stroke. So when I train, you know, someone had a stroke, they might as well not have gone to the emergency room. There's nothing to do. Very serious thing, but mm -hmm. nothing to do, right? You just wait to see what the level of deficit is and do rehabilitation. Not true anymore. Now, if somebody f is experiencing the signs of stroke, right, which are predominantly one-sided weakness or change in sensation or inability to speak, you want them to go immediately to an emergency room. You don't want them to wait. And so there are campaigns, not by us, but nationally on stroke. So what you want are campaigns that are around the one and two issues, especially stroke and chest pain. Someone has a gunshot, they know they have to go to the emergency department, right? I mean, people, blood, people associate, okay, gotta go. What, what you want is that people who have the kinds of symptoms, oh, my left arm is a little achy and my, my fingers feel kind of numb, I'll just wait and see if that goes away, right? No, you got to go to the emergency room. Same with people who have, you know, stroke symptoms. On the other hand, for the ones you raised, four and five, right, we really want our message to be, you know, if, if you are having a cough, you know, you have an earache, your ankle or knee is bothering you, you should see your primary care doctor where you'll have a better experience, you'll build continuity. So we, uh, we've been focused primarily in health and hospitals on trying to teach the people in the, the four and five area to go. We've had a very positive experience with express care um, and I appreciate that this uh, council has been very supportive of it. We have it running at uh, Lincoln Hospital and at Elmhurst, and it's making a huge difference. And the basic idea of Express Care was let's help people who have always gone to the emergency room to know uh, that they can get care in a primary care setting, but they still, if they arrive in the emergency room, we can get them to a primary care setting. So instead of trying to message something very complicated, when they arrive at the ED, we say, you can, you're welcome to stay at the ED. But if you go just around the corner, uh, 
not around the street corner, but just around the corridor corner, you can be seen in express care and you'll be seen right away. And so now fours and fives at those two hospitals are being seen often in and out within an hour mm -hmm. time. Uh, we're going to open in Jacoby um, in a few more months. Um, we appreciate the support of our council member from Jacoby. We're going to create an urgent care at Gouverneur, uh, which the chair has raised. We, we already have, uh, it needs unfortunately in terms of delay, um, the ideal space that you and others have pointed out is a non-patient care space. So it requires a, a CON with the state. But, but it, I mean, it, it just means three or four months more. Uh, we have to apply to change a non-patient care space into a patient care space. And we, we could talk about the CON process all day because that's another issue. Right. And I know it's a state issue, um, and I'd love to kind of pick your brain about how to reform it. Um, so I, so you mentioned the emergency room and, and trying to at least direct people to what other services could, could be more appropriate. And that's great. I, I think the, the conversations that have been alarming that we've had with the nurses are it's, it's even though we're trying to maybe redirect them to have a primary care physician or to go to express care, they're still being forced to make some decisions that no medical professional or person in service should have to make between someone who has an asthma attack or someone sure. with chest pains. And some of these stories are absolutely heartbreaking, but these women, mostly women, of course, it, it, is, it is very diverse, but they are completely dedicated and, and you do have some incredible nurses within your yes. system. So, so since it's clear that we need more nurses, um, we need nurses from all different backgrounds and, and um, and, and really wanting to make sure that, that we're keeping them happy and as best way we can, knowing they're committed to the mission. How did recruiting in Los Angeles compare to here? Is it more difficult? Uh, the big difference that I had in Los Angeles that helped me is I had premiums for the, the specialty type services like ICU, neonatal, uh, OR, um, I had uh, differentials for hard to recruit areas like in Los Angeles that was Antelope Valley. But, but there are places here where it's harder to recruit even though it's not an Antelope Valley. Um, so that made a difference and I had better um, uh, steps for nurses, especially again, the critical area uh, and again, I want to work with NISNA and I appreciate their input, but from the data I've seen, the most critical area is about year two to five or six, um, where we don't step up the pay enough. So we, um, when the city's Office of Labor Relations looks at my nurses, they say, well, you can hire nurses, and it's true. I can hire nurses out of school. And I, the reason I can hire nurses out of school is because the other hospitals don't hire nurses out of school, right? So, so yes, I can hire nurses out of school. That, then I have to spend six months at the city's expense training them. Then at year two, I don't have the kind of step to keep them. So you have some amazing career nurses who are so committed to our mission that they're willing to earn twenty dollars or $25,000 less. Um, and that's, I'm lucky to have such, but other people, you know, people have expenses. New York City's expensive place to live. They go to another institution. Once you get to year five, six, or seven, you're usually okay. Um, because the, obviously they've made their major commitment. I'm not saying, I mean, people always move, change, but it's those years where in LA I had more the steps that would keep somebody in going. Also, the city's pension helps once you get to six or seven. But you know, you can't, at year two, you can't tell a nurse, well, if you work 30 years, you're gonna have a great you know, pension, right? The nurse is gonna say, well, right now I'm worried about paying for my kids' school shoes, right? Don't tell me, but once you get to year seven, eight, right, and there's a pension of 10, right years right I mean it helps so so I need those things that's what I had in LA that I don't have here okay um, I have a, a couple colleagues that I want to make sure they get to, to ask questions because it is a very busy day here at the council and I want to start with Councilmember Ayala 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have two questions. Uh, the first question is in regards to intro, um, I think uh, 13, actually intro 1351. Um, so, in your opinion, has the redirecting of patients to urgent care translated in a reduction in the number of patients being seen in the ER? Um, we have a small reduction uh, in patients being seen in the ER. We have a major, uh, the major improvement, though, is, the, is how long people in the 4 and 5 group are waiting. So if they would have, in other words, there's some replacement. You have a bunch of people who would have once been the ED, they're now going to express care, but we've had some more people now coming to the ED. So it hasn't so much decreased the ED wait time, but you have a large group of people who are being seen in and out within an hour and being connected to primary care. So maybe over time, as more and more people get used to the primary care model, it will increase ED, decrease ED wait time. So, so your opinion on the creation of some, of some sort of outreach campaign, do you think that would, would it be helpful? I think it, it, as long as it's in the ways we were talking about directed on who really needs to go to the ED, right, the stroke, the heart attack, and who really needs to go to primary care. So it, it can't be we want everybody to go to primary care because we don't want people with subcernal chest pain going to primary care. And it can't be we want everybody to go to the ED if they have a need because we'll swamp and they'll wind up with long wait time. So I think that the campaign has to be sophisticated to be about illness, and people get it. I think that uh, the, the, the Stroke Association, which is a national association, has been very targeted and I think successful at teaching people the signs of stroke. And to me, you know, that's, what, that's the level of campaign. You want the people to get the right care in the right place. Great, thank you. Is, uh, I'm not sure if this is a question for you, but um, in regards to Resolution 396, Resolution 396 calls on the state legislature to pass the Safe Staffing Quality Care Act to ensure that acute, uh, care facilities and nursing homes meet the appropriate uh, ratios. Do you know what the current ratios are? Yeah, the, so the, the legislation calls for a one to four in medical surgical wards, which is the bulk of a hospital. Uh, and that's the same as California. Uh, just to give you a sense of the difference uh, in what we're aiming for is one to six. Um, so that's what our staffing is currently based on. And that's because of my observation that in some places we weren't anywhere near one to six. Uh, well, again, if you go back to when I arrived, there was no plan. So we were at whatever we were at. Um, and in many cases, as the chair referred, there were ratios that were completely unacceptable to me. That is for nursing homes and acute care facilities? Uh, uh, one to six is any medical surgical ward. I'm not sure in, in skilled nursing, is it? Well, it's probably not one to six. It would no, be it's not one different. to six. It's something different, but that's not outlined on our staffing plan at the moment. We're working through that, but that's for all the acute inpatient, it's one to six. Uh, but our ICU would be is not one to six. ICU is one to two. Correct. But the level of care, um, the reason I ask mm -hmm. is because the resolution specifically speaks to acute care facilities and nursing homes, and I'm trying to make the distinction between uh, the staffing needs at a, at a clinical hospital as opposed to a nursing uh, home. So are they the same? Are they comparable? No, are they uh, they're, they're, not, they're not the same. I mean, people in nursing homes, uh, obviously, by, by definition, don't have acute illness. But they need a lot of care. Generally, more of the care is at the level of a personal care attendant. Because if they were acutely ill, they would be in the hospital. Uh, but you still need registered nurses. Only registered nurses can do a nurse assessment. Uh, so you need registered nurses because someone in a skilled nursing facility might suddenly develop a cough or shortness of breath. There has to be a nurse uh, to assess them, and nurses are needed for all of the prescriptions for medications. But the uh, uh, we don't yet, again, a year and a half ago, we had no established work plan for any of our facilities. Now we have it for the acute care, and we're working on it for nursing homes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Councilmember Levine. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And it's, it's great to see you, Dr. Katz, and your team. And, and I appreciate not just your work in general, but what you've said today, today about the importance of nursing, one of the toughest jobs in our society, one of the most important. And as you thankfully have acknowledged, this is about patient outcomes. Data 
has shown for, for years, maybe even decades, that the level of nursing staffing directly impacts health outcomes for the patients in their care. And, and, and you've acknowledged that, and we appreciate that. I will say that um, I think your frustration about retention of nurses is directly connected to staffing ratios because burnout is, is an unavoidable result when nurses have unrealistic workloads. Um, it impacts patients first and foremost, but it also impacts nurses who even under the best of circumstances, frontline nursing is so stressful and so difficult. Um, but when you have five, 10, 15 patients, um, and we do hear reports of, of levels that high, um, my goodness, I, I can only imagine the impact on those professionals. And so sure, you're gonna lose patients who can go to private hospitals, voluntary hospitals, where the ratios are lower. Probably not low enough there either, but um, my sense is that um, probably lower than they are in the public hospitals. Um, you have identified four to one as the standard set in California and six to one as your current goal, but I gather that you're not always able to meet that goal. Is that right? That's correct. So can you speak about how frequently you are at ratios higher than six to one and what you have seen as the highest ratios that you've had to uh, endure? Sure. Um, so uh, the, the way that it currently is, we, are, we have a plan for every ward to hit six to one. So, but if we can't recruit the nurses, we're not at six to one. And then what we're at is some combination of whatever loss we have at, at recruiting. Um, and then also uh, six to one, if there are a variety of people who call out sick, which occurs as you correctly point out, because people are burnt out, right? So, and, and it's, a, it's a bad cycle. So if, if a, a number of nurses go out because they're burnt out, then a nurse coming in knows how hard it's going to be. So even if you call for you know, backup, um, people don't want to come in because they know that they're potentially you know, going to be nursing under incredibly difficult conditions. Um, so I think you know, on, on wards, I've certainly known, especially at nights, on weekends, that it has been at various times at the beginning before we did this, you could, you could easily have had 1 to 9, 1 to 12. I don't think that, that that's currently today. Um, but again, uh, Dr. Katz is correct. Yeah. We've started, I, I started, I was appointed March 11th, and we've started daily staffing calls throughout the entire um, system for acute inpatient. And for the most part, we do hit the one to six. As he mentioned, it's usually night shift, um, sick calls, but that's why we've started the New York, the Nurses for New York City campaign, just to really, you know, boost the number of nurses with partnership with Neisner, of course. So we're, we're working as fast as we can. And, and a diff in addition to difficult conditions because of staffing ratios, um, Another factor affecting recruitment and retention are salaries. I know this is not a collective bargaining negotiation. This is a city council hearing. But the truth is that all the nurses that work for health and hospitals know that they could get more money in other environments. Now, they are dedicated. I've met so many of them, and they believe profoundly in your mission mm -hmm. and in the mission of supporting the neediest New Yorkers and 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 I and I'm sure you are so grateful that they've chosen absolutely to to um, to pursue a career in our public hospitals, but you can't avoid the fact that they all know that they can go for uh, they can get a higher salary elsewhere, and so that's critical to the recruitment problem. It's it's what you pay in a marketplace, and it's the kind of conditions you can offer through ratios. So. I really urge you to do what you need to to attract and recruit the great talent that we need um, and to do everything you can, ultimately for the sake of patients. I mean, we keep talking about nurses because they matter so much, but nurses would be the first to acknowledge that this is about patients and giving the best care that we can to them. And we know that having well-supported, uh, well compensated and, and most importantly having the right ratio for our nurses uh, is the best for everybody in the system. Thank you. Okay. I, I really appreciate uh, the City Council support means a lot. This is a, an example where uh, this is not like hiring in other city positions. 
Again, you can't, uh, a standard way, and this is true in LA or San Francisco, typically in city government, you say, well, can you hire? Okay, I can hire. I can hire brand new nurses out of school, right? Part of it is teaching the, the system that, well, but, but that I need to keep nurses, right? The, the question of whether I can hire new nurses to fill vacancies is not the whole issue. And a nurse is not a nurse is not a nurse. Right. If I don't have OR nurses, I can't do surgery. Right. right. And I could have enough nurses at medical surgery and still have a, a serious problem that impedes my ability to deliver care. And, and so I need help with working with the city system to understand the complexity of nurse staffing. And I think NISNA has a lot of expertise and uh, Dr. Sineas really knows the field. And I think together with the help of the mayor and the city council, this is a solvable problem. Yes, okay. Thank you again, Dr. Katz and to your team and thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. And, and mentioning, you know, the patients, community members are, are really concerned about the consolidation of hospitals across the city. This has been ongoing. There are local campaigns to try to save hospitals. Um, many elected officials have run on this very platform. How many emergency departments were in this city five years ago compared to 10 years ago? And how does that compare to today? I'm going to turn to my colleagues in public health. So, uh, introduce yourself. Rishi Sood, New York City Health Department. Uh, currently, there are 53 uh, emergency departments in uh, in New York City. We are. Um, I, I don't have the number of uh, uh, emergency departments from five or ten years ago, but we could uh, get back to you. I'm going to turn to Councilmember Jonai in a second. He has questions about the emergency department. I, I just want to know: Have there been increased wait times or other negative effects on emergency departments as a result of the consolidation? From what you've from what you've seen and the data you do have? So the health department does not have data on that topic, so we're not aware of that. I would uh, defer to health and hospitals on um, any questions about the uh, trends within the uh, emergency departments in h and &H. I, I would just say uh, nationally wait times are up. I mean, not just in New York. It's a national, it's been a national issue. Thank you. Council Member Jonai. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Katz, first of all, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, Thank you, sir. I think the world of you. Thank you. And the, um, the work that you've taken on uh, to really turn HHC um, into the health care provider for New Yorkers um, is a, nothing short of a, an incredible undertaking. And I'm looking forward to being a partner with you as we meet the hurdles ahead of us. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. For full disclosure, my wife is a registered nurse. So nurses are very near and dear to my heart uh, for the You're many You married reasons. well, sir. <laughs> I've been trained and programmed to say that repeatedly. Um, although she's a school nurse, um, the work that nurses do is by far uh, nothing short of God's work. And the overwhelming concerns that I hear repeatedly from our nurses is uh, they get caught up more into the day-to-day -day of recordings instead of providing the health care services that they need. You know, I, I've been told the stories, told, now could you imagine this, at a time when nurses actually gave massages to the patients. And it wasn't just a basic reading of a chart and checking off boxes. There was an interaction there. And it's a very difficult and tedious um, occupation where you have X number of patients and it's this requirement of having to fill out all these forms and the interaction, the compassion that's needed as well as the safety needs are impossible to meet. So we have major issues ahead of us and hopefully we can work on what most of my colleagues also brought up. Uh, but safe staffing is a major concern and ultimately it's in the best interest of the patient. Now let me begin with the real stuff. That was the easy, that was a softball. I want to get into the emergency rooms. I've introduced uh, two bills and a resolution. Intro 1351, where it requires, the proposed legislation required in New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to conduct an outreach campaign specifically, but not 
exclusively targeting schools and senior centers to inform New York City residents about the types of urgent care and emergency care facilities present in the city and the kinds of services they generally provide. Now we know that there's a problem with our emergency room where they're being used for the primary care physician. They're being used for non-emergency issues. So whether it be a headache, a cough, a sneeze, we're allowing our emergency rooms to take the role of primary care physicians, which is creating longer wait times. Now certainly while we try to educate the current society on when you use an emergency room and when you should be going to an urgent care or primary care physician. Investing in the future is a concern for me. We have to be proactive about this. And there's, why aren't we educating the next generation? And that's our children. So they know when to go to the emergency room, whether it be for stroke or whether it be for chest pain or shortness of breath or, or gunshot wounds that you know need immediate attention we need to start educating. And with educating our children, they do something else. They go back home and they educate grandma and grandpa and mom and dad. Those children are sponges. So we change behavior and we educate using that group as a platform. And seniors, obviously, for the obvious reasons, because they tend to have needs of the healthcare system uh, more than anyone else. Secondly, intro 1352, required Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to study the causes of prolonged wait times in the emergency rooms, as well as the effects of such wait time on the patient's health. Now, this is extremely concerning to me, because we know an emergency room you're being exposed to all sorts of airborne bacteria. Who's coughing, who's sneezing? So you can come in with one sickness and leave with something else. Along with that patient is the family member that accompanies the person. So whether you're taking the children with you, because obviously you don't know what time you're gonna get out of an emergency room, or you have a family member accompany you, you're exposing a healthy person potentially to an environment that isn't so healthy. The effects of being in an emergency room, and we know that you know, hand to mouth is always a problem. So I would hope that this would segue into the third issue, which is a resolution of calling on the New York State State Legislature to pass and the governor signed legislation requiring hospital emergency departments to improve their service to better inform patients of their potential wait time and other care options. I envision someday in the near future where you can pick up a phone and call 311, give a zip code and an address, and ask where is the least amount of wait time in an emergency room, whether it be private or public. I envision a day where a car can pull up and actually see a digital display, expected wait time before you park and get out of your car and do the registration. And also inform you that a nearby hospital has a lower wait time. I envision a day where ambulances that are summoned to these 911 calls can make a determination, especially in scenarios of code purple, where we know we have an inundated emergency room, we know they have there's no available beds in a hospital, that they can assess the medical needs and possibly take them to an urgent care facility or an express care facility, as you mentioned. These are all within our reach. But the worst part of all of this is according to some of the recent publications, in New York State, the New York City hospitals have some of the worst wait times in the emergency rooms in the entire state, have some of the worst wait times for available beds, spending days in corridors waiting for a room, 
and some of the wait, worst wait times to see a physician. All making the experience one that prevents people from seeking health care, not getting the health care, and we have to be proactive and not reactive, uh, not giving them the encouragement to go to an emergency room if need be, or an urgent care for fear of what the outcome may be. New Yorkers deserve more than the current treatment that they get. This is some of the, ba our role in government, our priority is health and safety. Everything else is secondary. And to our most vulnerable, the sick. So I want to hear from you on what you think of these three bills, what we aligned or described as something that in the near future will help improve the healthcare services in an efficient way, in the most effective way, and to make sure that we don't overburden our healthcare systems, our safety nets, treating non-emergency um, issues in an emergency room environment. Thank you. I, I think you have a very thoughtful critique. Uh, I think you're right on, on all the points. Uh, I think these are all problems that together we can solve. Um, they do have multiple parts to them. Uh, a, a couple of uh, thoughts to amplify the things you said. One of my critiques of uh, the way primary care is set and the way most private doctor's offices are, it's Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, uh, and probably not Friday afternoon. Imagine how any of us would feel if the airlines were like that. Right. If you wanted to fly somewhere and they said to you, oh, well, you can only fly Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. You'd be, well, what do you mean? Um, there's no inherent reason why, why outpatient centers can't work in the evenings and the weekends, especially in most families where two parents are working right, in order to make a living, to, to live in a place like New York. So I'm pushing hard on the idea that we at Health and Hospitals need to have evening hours and we need to have weekend hours. Um, the other one um, that I think uh, can help is that there's new federal legislation that would allow an ambulance to bring someone uh, who called 911 to an alternative destination. So it used to, well, still today, you call 911, the ambulance comes, and you want to go to urgent care, they can't take you and get paid. And so they won't take you. Right, they 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 either. What, uh, that's a great point. Yeah. What's the cost of a ambulance ride? Oh my God, I'd say at least a thousand dollars. Could you imagine that we're spending a thousand dollars on transportation? Is really what we're doing. Right. Absolutely, it's a huge mistake. Right. So I, but I think you know, all, you have all the right points. We want to want to educate people about who really needs to be in the ED and who doesn't. Uh, so that you, 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 you have the, right, the people getting the right care in the right place. You don't want people sick for reasons that, uh, they, of what they're exposed to. There is no reason in this technological world where we can all order dinner and know right on our phones when they're preparing it. Right, I ordered my elderly parents dinner last night. Right, they tell me when it's in the kitchen on my phone, when the person leaves the delivery. I mean, why? For something that's really pretty trivial, I could just wait the 40 minutes. My parents aren't going anywhere, right? But for a life-threatening issue, we, we can't know that. There's no, there's no technological reason, right? Again, we, we have to, as you're doing, prioritize what people's knowledge. Um, I think at this point, though, I, I do want to, since some of your first two things are specific to the Department of Health, may we ask uh, them their, their view? And I want to thank the chair for being so patient. I'm a bit long-winded. Uh, so thank you, council member, for that and for, uh, for your questions. I, I just want to note that um, so we are, uh, we are as a, uh, at the department, as you know, interested in protecting and promoting the health of all New Yorkers. And we have a, a variety of campaigns. Um, we are, um, uh, though, not in a position uh, where we have legal jurisdiction over uh, the hospitals uh, in New York City. The state regulates all hospitals uh, in uh, New York City. Repeat that one more time because we're going to 
dissect that. This is about how we improve health care. And I understand that New York State dictates most of the policy. But there's certainly something that we can do collectively, especially when we're thinking about the, when, we, when we understand the actual breaks and what's not working collectively, whether it be patients, hospitals, uh, labor, and government, we should all be sitting together and deciding what to do to improve health care more efficiently and more effectively. Absolutely, and and we share uh, we share your um, uh, we share your concerns. Uh, I um, I just wanted to note that we don't have legal jurisdiction, and we do not license and regulate the hospitals. We do have uh, a variety of campaigns where we are uh, always seeking to uh, inform New Yorkers about the options, including our uh, Get Covered NYC campaign, which provides free health insurance enrollment and educational materials to both help New Yorkers get health insurance, but also understand their options. Understand uh, that we are interested in encouraging the use of primary and preventive care. That's a partnership between health and hospitals, the Department of Health uh, uh, and Mental Hygiene, HRA, the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit, and other city uh, organizations and, and uh, agencies, uh, because we want people to know what their options are. So what are we going to do to encourage? Because we have to educate, and then use of encouragement is a very loosely defined word. So we are, uh, we share your goals, and so we are uh, uh, looking forward to having future conversations with you about uh, both the intent of these bills and what we can do together as city agencies uh, and as city government, and uh, and we're interested in working along with uh, other partners in the community as well. So over the summer, DOH can be working on a program that we can start ele educating elementary school children on when they should use an emergency room and when they should seek other healthcare services from primary care to urgent care to having their own primary care physician. So that's something that uh, the Department of Education, the Office of School Health, both in the Health Department and the Department of Education would be something we would want to involve them in and have conversations with them about what we can specifically do in schools. Great. So I'm looking forward to working on that over the next three months ahead of the new school year so we can actually have a curriculum, a program in place. We look forward to discussions with you on this. Thank you. Okay, very ambitious summer. I want to Council finish my, I, 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 did anybody answer? Do you want to get back to this, Dr. Katz, or? I, 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 we just want to work with you. I think that this could make a huge difference uh, for health in New York City and for the running of the hospitals. And just for the record, I can go online now and I can register in Westchester, in White Plains, with an urgent care, online, tell me my wait time is five minutes, I'm pre-registered when I get there, so I don't have to spend more time in an environment that could possibly have airborne illnesses um, and expose me to other ailments that I should be worried about. Proves your point. It's, it's The technology is not the issue. Thank you. Thank hey, you. We'll have a hearing on that with the technology committee and the new chair. So um, I just want to ask you maybe one more question because there are a lot of people here to testify and I want to make sure that I get to them, but I also know that they were very interested in hearing your testimony and answers to our questions to, to further their advocacy and their information. So um, the nurses, incredibly important. We talked a lot about that today. We mentioned the patients. I want to ask about the, the team, right, the team that is in place in our public health system. It's, it's the nurses, but it's also the nurse technicians. It's the doctors, and, and it's, it's everyone else, administration, people who are really trying to work together to, to run these really fairly large facilities, some of which, as we all know, there are 150 languages spoken in, in, in them. So um, what are the current workloads for direct care staff in New York City? For example, the nurse techs. Uh -huh. Um, you know, I don't have the number, but I want to uh, illustrate how important your point is from a real-life issue that happened last night at Harlem Hospital. Uh, Dr. Wei, who's uh, our chief of quality, he works in all our emergency rooms, and he worked in Harlem last night. Um, and he was talking about one of the challenges he faced as an emergency room physician is that the hospital only had two patient transporters. You say, well, patient transporters, I'm, this, is a, this is a hearing about nurses. But if the patient has to go to the MRI scanner or the CT scanner 
and you don't have any patient transporters, what are you going to do? Right? Either a doctor or a nurse has to transport the patient. Right. So, I mean, at every level, uh, as you began the question, it's a team sport. Right. If you, it, same on, on a medical surgical ward, if you don't have enough personal care assistance, then the registered nurses who are incredibly well trained are changing the linen. Well, somebody has to change the linen. You don't want patients in soiled linen, but you don't need to go to school for multiple years to change linen. Right, it's a, it's a wrong responsibility for a registered nurse. So, I mean, I, I'm going to turn to Dr. Sineas on, on our goal, but all our, the, our staffing plans have to include all of the other people who impact the work of nurses. Uh, we're very specific on what are registered nurse jobs, but caring people are going to do whatever patients need. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that doesn't always lead to an efficient operation if you're using registered nurses to transport patients. Yeah. So for ancillary support, um, right now the goal is up to eight patients, each in the med surge units, and it varies based on the unit, of course, and critical care, they would have um, less patients, of course. And you mean a personal care assistance by? Right. Right. By patient care associates. But we also have to, and again, this is, and remember that the, at least the organization I found 16 months ago, all of these things were historic. If there were four transporters in the hospital on night shift, there were four, right? If it doesn't, and if two call out sick, then there are two. Uh, the idea is to move to the way a modern hospital runs, where you say, you start by how many transporters do I need for this volume of patients in order for the nurses not to have to transport the patients, mm -hmm. right? And so. It, it can be the number of uh, radiology techs. Mm -hmm. Again, you say, well, what does that have to do with it? Well, in an emergency room, if the number of people waiting for x-ray gets too long, then there are more patients sitting in the emergency room waiting to go for x-ray. So again, even if there's a transport person, if you don't have enough techs, hospitals are incredibly interdependent. No, and, and some of the nurses have said they've They'll, they'll, and they'll do anything to, in order to make sure that the patient is comfortable and receiving the services they need. They've mopped floors, they've fixed the television, you know, in order to get that, that, that level, that source of, of comfort for the patient. Mm -hmm. So I know that they do it all. Um, and I know that there's also, and this is my last question for you, is about <laughs> drafting, uh, recruiting, and retaining physicians. How is that going? I know it's a challenge nationwide, and I know that many doctors come here to train and then go elsewhere. So how are those efforts going? I know there's also someone here from the Doctors' yes, Council Kevin who I want to recognize that is doing great work around this and making sure that our doctors are being taken care of. Uh, we've had a lot of success uh, with the uh, recruiting uh, now for physicians based on the recruitment video and, and again, a re-engaged, you know, this is about mission. Um, and uh, there still are issues and again, uh, it's some, from my point of view, it's about teaching the city system about the differences, just like a doctor, is, a nurse is not a nurse is not a nurse, a doctor is not a doctor is not a doctor. Right now, we have tremendous problems recruiting psychiatrists because there's a sheer shortage of it. We have trouble recruiting anesthesiologists, not because there's a sheer shortage of it, but because other system salaries went bumped significantly up and ours stayed the same. Um, so teaching the city, okay, it may be true that in general, a city negotiates contracts for every three years, but I need the ability, if all of the anesthesiologists are earning significantly more across New York City and I want surgery to continue, you can't tell me to wait for negotiations to open. I have to be able to do something today uh, in order to maintain surgeries. Otherwise, again, I wind up losing money because I, I have the surgeon and the nurses and the patient, but no anesthesiologist. So I guess what I'd say in general, better, but, but there's work to be done, room for improvement. And we want to be helpful. So um, I know that we have tremendous talent already here in New York City, and I want to thank you for bringing your talents to H&H &H, as well as the team. And this is really just about making sure that we're taking care of New Yorkers. And I know that health and hospitals specifically takes care of 
the poorest, um, the poorest New Yorkers, our, our immigrant community, so many. And I want to just thank you and thank everyone here for their time. Uh, I do want to move on. We have some incredible people here to, to testify. So thank you for your thank testimony. You. Thank you for answering our questions thoughtfully and honestly. And with that, I will call the first panel, Judith Cutchin, Judy Sheridan Gonzalez, Ann Bovey, Pat James, and I want to say it's Patty, oh, Patty Kane. Patty Kane. Thank you. Good. Yeah. You did great. And we have plenty of chairs. Thanks. Ready when you are. My name is Ann Bove, and I just retired from the city system after 40 years of service at Bellevue Hospital. Um, I'm part of the board of directors of NISNA as well as the, um, on the board of directors for CPHS. And sorry to, Ms. Bove, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do, we're going to put a timer on just so people have an idea of, okay? Thank you. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, no. so basically I can give you a historical framework in terms of safe staffing. Um, I'm not going to belabor it with what the staffing was in 1978 when I walked into Bellevue Hospital. I'm just going to leave that alone. But in the late 1980s, we were able to negotiate a contract and a safe staffing program that was developed contractually and it's been passed out in front of you and what was done with that was it was a joint effort between labor and management and actually there were no lines between labor and management it was done in a very scientific framework first of all there was a patient classification system that looked to the amount of hours that was required to take care of the patient Subsequent to that, the skill mix was looked to each one of those particular items. And then it was applied to a formula known as the full-time equivalent. Where this was um, challenged was when they took the average daily census. And one of the issues that I heard talked about was sick time, and that's your replacement factor. And one of the things that was depleted from that replacement factor in terms of staffing was to account for sick time. So. The idea was is that you know initially we accounted for sick time, annual leave time, and any time that the, the nurse may have earned. But once you start pulling out sick time, then the reserve just isn't there. Um, the system worked, and it worked for a number of years until we had a mayor whose name shall not be mentioned, who did not support New York City Health and Hospitals, formerly known as Health and Hospitals. So he kind of let the system fall apart. But during the years that we had the system intact, there was very little agency and very little overtime. And the system also included a reliability and validity component that established the fact that these numbers were real. And um, I've, I've submitted this to the state in terms of that the governor had in his budget with regards to the state plan for review in terms of looking at it. Because you know, when you say, for example, when you say, um, an ICU's ratio should be one is to two. In Bellevue Hospital, there's things like um, a continuous renal replacement therapy. It's a level one trauma center. ECMO, which is also another um, procedure or another adjunct that's required in a very critical care setting, requires two nurses to one patient. So there, there's a look at what needs to be done and what's required by the patient and subsequently reevaluated accordingly. So, I mean, I could tell you a lot more. I've been in front of city council when AIDS was an issue to get more staff, to get more staff for the critical care areas, to acknowledge that CCUs were not just little telemetry units, and to look at spinal cord injury um, in terms of making sure that the med surge areas were appropriately staffed accordingly. So this is not the first time that 
city council as a body heard about this, but it's, it's now your turn to hear about it. And hopefully we'll be able to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Judith Cutchin. I'm the president of the Health and Hospital Executive Council and mayoral agencies um, in the five boroughs. I'm also a registered nurse for 29 years, 28 of those in Woodhall Hospital, where I work as a head nurse in a specialty practice. I'm also a lifelong H&H &H patient. I would like to thank hospital committee chair, Carlina Rivera, and council members Cabrera and Salamanca for their work on this critical issue. I am here to testify in support of Resolution 396 with amendments. You will hear from my colleagues throughout the city why this resolution is so important to the patients of New York City. And I would like to start by discussing the proposed amendments to this bill. We believe that safe staff and save lives, and we are committed to providing a high quality health care regardless of the patient's ability to pay. That's why we are committed to H&H. &H. And the following are a few of the amendments that we support and would like to see in the bill. The rest are listed in the testimony in which you have a copy of. Resolution 396, resolution calling upon the New York City Council to endorse state enactment of the Safe Staff and for Quality Care Act to ensure that all acute care facilities and nursing homes meet minimum safe staffing ratios and standards for nurses and other direct care staff, and further calling upon the City of New York to consider pursuing similar local legislation requiring New York City health and hospital system and other providers receiving funding from or contracting to provide services to the City of New York to meet equivalent minimum minimum staffing requirement, whereas according to the United States Department of Health and Human Service, the inadequacy of nurse and other direct care staffing level leads to poor patient outcomes. And whereas the National Institute of Health and other research shows that better staffing policies not only result in better patient outcome, but also lower the operating costs of health care providers by reducing the recruitment and training expenses resulting from staff burnout and turnover, lowering the penalties and reduced reimbursements imposed on penalized poor patient outcomes and unnecessary admissions, lowering patient length of stay, reducing legal and malpractice costs, increasing staff productivity due to the lower workplace injuries and fatigue and increase in patient satisfaction scores and hospital quality and rating. Whereas according to the report published by the Health Service Research in 2012, nursing homes which have safe staffing ratios have better quality of care and therefore facilities and improved a functional status of residents, and whereas the safe staffing for quality act would require all acute hospitals and nursing homes in New York State to comply with specific minimum nurse to patient ratios and staffing requirements, submit a faculty staffing plan to the State Department of Health and require public disclosure of actual hospitals and nursing homes staffing levels, and be it resolved that the New York City Council calls upon legislation to pass the governor to enact the safe staff and the quality act care to ensure that acute care for facilities and nursing home meet appropriate minimum staffing ratios for nurses and direct care staff and be it further resolved that the New York City Council commits to pursuing the implementation of minimum staff staffing ratios and standards in New York City health and hospital system and all other acute care hospitals and nursing homes that receive funding from contract to provide patient care services. I support resolution 396 as we propose to amend it and look forward to its passage. Safe staff and save lives. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Judy Sheridan Gonzalez. Oh, I have to turn this on. Push it's it. good. You're good. You got me? Yeah. Um, president of New York State Nurse Association and an ER nurse for over 35 years in the Bronx, the county with the worst health statistics in the state. Um, you know, countless studies have shown that safe staffing saves lives. Uh, the most recent study reported in Crane's Business evaluated 100,000 patients from 2007 to 2012. And the Columbia University researchers found that the risk for infection was 15% higher in areas understaffed on all shifts. Uh, weakened by illness and trauma, patients die of sepsis and system failure as a result of these infections. And medical errors are the leading cause of mortality in the United, uh, the third leading cause of mortality in the United States, with over 400,000 deaths a year reported annually, and many unreported. And of course, RNs are the single most effective mitigator of such errors. Uh, when we have enough staff. So when we speak about safe staffing, we're not just talking about back rubs. We're actually talking about saving lives, perhaps the life of a member of your own family. 
Morally, wealthy will ensure patients are cared for in facilities with special amenities units where an adequate staff is provided with superior outcomes. Poor patients in the same facility but with reduced staff <coughs> suffer worse outcomes. Staffing legislation would level the playing field, remanding all hospitals to uphold the same standard. Safety net hospitals struggle to counter these obstacles, but some uh, perform surprisingly well. The LeapFrog Group reported in 2016 that five New York City facilities with the highest ratings were actually in health and hospitals, which also serves a disproportionate number of uninsured, provides most mental health and trauma care, and serves as first responder and key promoter of the public's health. And financially, the myth of unspeakable costs associated with safe staffing is countered by multiple longitudinal studies. A doll study published in Medical Care estimated that adding 133,000 RNs to the U.S. workforce, which would achieve the 75th percentile of safe staffing, would produce savings of $6.1 billion. And locally, H&H is far more cost effective than the private hospitals if analyzed comprehensively. Hidden costs built upon the codependency of the two structures, where a New York City funds, contract, funds contracted services and pays indirect subsidies to private systems, as well as provides hundreds of millions in tax exemptions to them. Such data is elaborated in a 2017 white paper by renowned researchers Barbara Caress and James Parrott. Safe staffing legislation on any government level would assist in creating common ground from which to evaluate the two systems' efficiencies and functioning in addition to providing higher quality care. We believe the passage of the amended Resolution 396 would be a critical step. And I just want to make a, a story, because one story is really worth a thousand statistics. This is uh, without um, doing a HIPAA violation. Uh, a colleague had a stroke recently, um, uh, one of our colleagues at, at Montefiore. And he was brought to Jacoby Medical Center, which is a city hospital. He received excellent care. They saved his life, immediately initiated the appropriate medication, and he recovered beautifully. He was transferred to Montefiore, where he knew people, he was placed in a hallway on a stretcher for hours and didn't get a bed and said, why did they take me out of Jacoby? Just a story. Good afternoon, my name is Patricia James. I'm a registered nurse at Hilton, Hilton Hospital Kings for 35 years in the maternal child unit. I serve as vice president of the executive council of Hilton Hospital and Mayoros, and as a vice president of the local bargaining unit. Thank you to hospital committee chair, uh, Carlina Rivera for holding today's hearing. I am honored today to offer my testimony on a topic as serious and dear to my heart, safe staffing. In my specific area of work, safe staffing is key to the well-being of mothers and families and to all aspects of child care. The optimum staffing level in this setting is one nurse for three mothers and three babies, that's three dyads, which accounts for a total of six patients. Presently, in some cases, there are five or six mothers and babies, totally in 10 to 12 patients per nurse, which is not advisable for best practice of quality health care. A critical aspect to all is a serious increase in maternal and infant mortality rates. We need safe staffing that protects patients and save lives. Safe staffing save lives. Also of importance is the need for direct care staff to assist mothers and babies at the bedside, particularly in cases after a patient undergoes a cesarean section. Direct care professionals help mothers to transfer the babies from the crib for bonding, skin to skin, and to assist in breastfeeding, and provide all the necessary aid in the beginning days of motherhood. New York City Health and Hospital is striving to be the premier mother-baby friendly health system and safe staffing helps us to get closer to our primary goal of creating a safe environment of overall health, including mother and family education, such as breastfeeding and components that create a baby friendly environment. We need safe staffing to ensure the best possible health care and outcomes for our patients. Evidence has shown that adequate staffing is the correct number of nurses scheduled for the number of patients based on area of specialization and acuity. This leads to better outcomes for patients in our community, including lower mortality rates, fewer readmissions, fewer incidents of harm occurring while in the hospital, and better quality of care. Safe staffing is also better for nurses in the hospitals because it causes, one, better revenue earnings, two, higher HCAP scores, how patients rate and care they receive, good patient satisfaction, four, good staff outcomes and less stress and burnout, and five, better staff retention. But the most important thing is that safe staffing saves lives. Safe staffing of nurses and direct care professionals lends itself to more patient education, which may lead to good self-management of chronic conditions. 
decreased emergency room visits, increased compliance to clinic appointments, and adherence to taking their medications, required diets, exercise, and rest. These can all lead to a better quality of life and a healthier community, and may play a crucial role in decreasing maternal mortality. That's why I support Resolution 396, which includes nurses and direct caregivers. Thank you. Hi, and thank you, Madam Chair, for um, addressing this very important issue because have, ha as you have heard, safe staffing does save lives. And I believe if we all work together, we can really improve health care for all of New York and save lives. Um, my name is Pat Kane. I'm treasurer of the New York State Nurses Association. We are the um, oldest association and union of registered nurses in the nation. And I'm here today to speak in support of the amended resolution 396. Um, I've worked as a registered nurse at Staten Island University Hospital for over 30 years, most recently in the open heart operating room. I'd like to say I love the mission of health and hospitals, but unfortunately in my borough, to serve my community, I don't have the option of acute care of, of working in one, otherwise I would be. Um, just recently, as Judy mentioned, Columbia did release a study that supports safe staffing. And in that finding, there was actually an increase of 15% in infection rates at hospitals that showed consistent poor staffing on the day and night shifts. And that is a very substantial finding. We know from other peer-reviewed studies that patient death rates are also tied to nurse staffing. With minimum nurse to patient ratios, we can provide cost efficient care that improves outcomes and ultimately saves lives. And I know you talked a lot about the emergency room and we heard about the triage and the ones and twos, the most critically ill. Well, actually there are basically ratios in critical care on many of our, in many of our hospitals throughout New York where one nurse would typically have no more than two patients. Sometimes um, with the procedures uh, Ms. Bovet talked about, there could be two nurses to one patient. But in the ER, when those one and twos are staying in the ER, there really is an unlimited amount that one nurse can be responsible for. And that's a big problem. Um, the other thing is, and Dr. Katz spoke about keeping nurses on the jobs, keeping nurses on the job. And with minimum nurse to patient ratios, they will stay. That's how important safe staffing is to nurses. So I want to say if you pass it, they will come. What makes this city great is also our commitment to equality. Having a single standard of RN safe staffing ratios is ultimately about equality. A quality of care in acute hospitals, public and private, so that all patients receive care from their bedside nurses working the front lines of care that's the same. And what indicator of equality could be more meaningful than a care ratio linked to mortality rates? But today, unfortunately, that fundamental equalizer of care governing the lives of New Yorkers is totally out of whack, and we must work together to change that. So we also ask for your support for the resolution put forward today so that the legislature and governor will hear your voice. The voice of the New York City Council, as we all know, is heard not just in Albany, but throughout the country. And that is how important your role is on New York City Council. With a vote for this resolution, you stand for equality, fundamental equality, so that every New Yorker, no matter what her stature, wealth, or position, will receive proper care from hospital nurses working according to professionally supported minimum nurse to patient ratios in all of our hospitals. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. I just have a, a couple quick questions for you all. Um, you're going to hear some testimony uh, today, should you have the time to, to stick around, and I want to thank you for all the time you've given this committee already, um, and that, that a strict ratio is not the way to go. Do you think there's an alternative way to achieve safe staffing practices without implementing this strict ratio? I had a feeling you would answer, Anne. <laughs> well, the, if you look at what I gave you, okay. Basically, it came to ratios, but they were, you know, amendable because you were looking at the acuity level most directly of the patient. So that in terms of understanding certain things with regards to treatment modalities, that required a certain setup in terms of nurse to patient ratios. And it was allocated by, by that uh, acuity system that was then later tested by a reliability and validity framework. 
Um, sometimes just by the advance of new technology, you know that some, I mean, I worked at Bellevue for 40 years, and as technology changed through the years, like for example, most recently, CRRT, which is continuous renal replacement therapy, is done in the ICU. That patient in that ICU has two nurses on that one patient to, to handle the complexity of that equipment. And also ECMO in terms of um, CV PACU with regards to, once again, two nurses to one patient. I also want to dovetail something that I didn't mention earlier, and that's the idea of recruitment and retention. I mean, when I started at Bellevue, I was making, now remember, this is 1978, I was making 12000 a year. If I had worked at the old Beekman downtown, it would, I would have made 16000 So that was a significant amount of money. But what kept me at Bellevue was the mentorship, the training, and the availability of resources and the belief in the system <laughs> that, that came to me. And um, one of the things that's lacking in today's world as to why you're losing young nurses is they don't have the transition in terms of the educational process. Now, I know that there's a beginning mentorship program, but it's connected to NYU and Columbia. And we have CUNY. And I'm a graduate of CUNY times three, and I'm extremely proud of the education that I got and the education that I saw. Public sector to public sector. We shouldn't be getting money out of the system. We should be keeping money in the system. Lehman, Hunter, all the CUNYs. When you look at their pass rate on the boards and you start comparing them to the private sector, there's no comparison. So the transition needs to be worked upon you need to augment your staff development departments, and you need to facilitate a training process that actually was established and has been chipped away through the years. But I'm sorry, CUNY to New York City Health and Hospitals, there is no better match. And, and why I'm bringing that up today is because I do a, a little program at Bellevue where I try to do that kind of bridge thing, and I named it after someone who mentored me, okay? But a nurse walked in who I taught 25 years ago and who was in that same student nurse program. So it works. There's dedication and commitment. And it's like, I was only going to work a year there. Well, I don't know what happened, but 40 years went by. <laughs> and I'd still be there, except, you know, I'm, I'm 63. Thank you. you. I, 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 I just want to talk a yeah. little bit about the flexibility issue. Yeah. Um, because first of all, I think you really need to read the le legislation. Because this, again, sets a minimum standard. And in healthcare, I think most people know this is a very uh, well-regulated sector. And we have a lot of minimum standards. So there actually is flexibility in the legislation to deal with things like Anne talked about. And the other thing I want to say is, this is a staffing plan, right? So it provides for a number of nurses, very specific for the type of care going on in the unit. But within the nurses, and among ourselves, we do this all the time, in terms of how we split that up, if a patient becomes critically ill, I mean, you'll often see four nurses run into that patient's room. Um, and that uh, continues to happen, and that's, that's just the way, as Dr. Katz said and others have said, we work as a team. So when people say that this is a very strict ratio, it actually isn't if you look at the, if you look at the actual legislation mm -hmm. and if you look at the actual way that we work. What this provides for is a staffing plan that, that would mandate mm -hmm. at least a number of, having a number of adequate nurses in that unit so that we can deal with um, things that do arise, as they will. Nobody can certainly predict what's going to go on uh, sometimes from minute to minute. Um, but certainly there is flexibility uh, in this. Uh, and just to add, you know, we are a society which has standards everywhere. Why do we not have standards in nursing care, right? Why is that the one area where we can't have a real standard? We're talking about a minimum number. Just like if you pass a test, you can have 65 to pass a test, but people have room all to go all the way to the 100. You can't be a lawyer unless you graduate law school. We have minimum standards everywhere. This is a minimum standard to allow for anything that can happen. And these are hospitals, and anything can happen and does happen all the time. So this minimum standard gives, provides a floor from which we can move things around so that we can save lives. So when four nurses have to go in that room to resuscitate that patient, somebody else doesn't exaggerate in the next room because there's nobody there for that person. We have to have enough of a cushion so that we can save lives when those things happen. That's really what it is. It's all about minimum standards and totally, totally flexible. 
No, and I want to also thank you um, for for mentioning about retention and like if we have safe staffing, nurses will stay. They have mm -hmm. just a better work environment. They're able to support their colleagues. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the mission that typically brings nurses to the public sector anyway. anyway. And so, mm -hmm. and and the idea is is that you know everybody talks about the other. It's all New York. I mean, I go there, and you know I have insurance. You know, and, you know, it's um, I'm actually second generation to the system because I grew up hearing that, you know, about access to care and about how open the system is and and everybody has equal equal chance. And and there's no other system that's better than that in the city or in the country unless there's another public sector system that mimics what HHC does. But um, or New York City Health and Hospitals. But it's the idea of the support that we give each other. And with the new graduate, they need the support, they need the contact, they need the person there that they can run to if they don't feel secure in what they're doing. And that's really also what's lacking in the system right now. Well, thank you. So, and, and what's the name of your mentor that you named the program after? Margaret Whitehorn. She was a Bellevue School of Nursing graduate. <laughs> Well, thank you all. Thank all of you so much for your time, and thank you to to Miss Whitehorn as well for for her mentorship. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I want her. I want her. She's an assembly woman. Okay, I'm going to call up uh, our honor to have our the New York State Assemblywoman for the 87th district, uh, Karinas Reyes. I'm also going to call up uh, Jalissa Saud, uh, Carolyn Esposito, Ari Moma, Alicia McMyers, and yes. Leon Bell. Justin. Do you want to go away? Do you want us to give our testimony or you want to just go right in order? Probably should put on my glasses. Thank you. We can start. Ready? Sure. Um, so good afternoon, Chairwoman. Thank you for having me here. Um, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share my testimony with all of you today. My name is Karina Estreyes, um, registered nurse and assembly member for the 87th District in the Bronx, representing the neighborhoods of Parkchester, Van Ness, Castle Hill, and West Farms. Uh, just days before I walked the halls of our state capitol in Albany, I was a full-time staff nurse on the oncology unit, unit at Montefiore's Weiler Hospital in the Bronx. My experience caring for the sickest members of my community were the impetus that made me decide to run for office. It's impossible to deny all the incredible medical advances that help us identify and treat diseases sooner and help people live longer. However, these scientific advances can never supplant the human aspect of healthcare. I would like to illustrate for you a typical 12-hour shift uh, for, a, what a, for a nurse. So my day would begin at 7 a.m. with a brief handoff report from the outgoing nurse, and he, and she, he or she would update me on the overall medical history of my patient, the current problem or reason for admission, the plan of care, any medical interventions that have happened while admitted, any intervention that took place in the past 12 hours, any pending interve interventions that I have to execute during my shift. I would then perform a thorough assessment of my patient to establish a baseline at the time of handoff, and this includes vital signs, auscultating breath and bowel sounds with my stethoscope, assessing circulatory status, and I want to add that this is often the best way to identify small bowel obstructions, beginnings of pneumonia, pulmonary embolisms, even before a patient becomes symptomatic. So it's important to note that these are some of the most common and often deadly post-surgical complications. And under these circumstances, early detection by an experienced cl clinician can be the difference between life or death um, for these patients. And then I would continue my assessment. I would verify IV drips um, to make sure they're consistent with doctor's orders. 
um, assessing medical equipment connected to the patient and physically as inspecting any wounds or dressings that a patient may have. And lastly, I would document my findings in the uh, EMR, the electronic record. And I would do this for every single one of my patients assigned to me. And my patients consisted of anywhere between five or eight um, patients varying uh, with different degrees of acuity. So imagine that while I try to complete my baseline assessments, the call bells are going off, patients need to be helped to the bathroom, or, uh, or need to be medicated for pain, or transferred to a stretcher because they had to leave the unit for a test. And simultaneously, the kitchen brings up the breakfast trays. And many of my patients are unable to feed themselves, so the food will sit in front of them until someone has the time to feed them. And by 9 a.m., I have to have review with all of my patients' labs. And by 10 a.m., I need to begin preparing and administering each patient's medications. Some patients can have tens of medications, including multiple IV infusions, due by 10 a.m. So my day would continue at this space, at this pace, with very little room for error. It was an emergency, if there was an emergency that interrupted this very tight schedule, every patient under my care would feel the brunt of it. And my fellow nurses would have to pitch in at the expense of the patients under their care. So when we say that safe staffing saves lives, it's as simple as that. It literally saves lives. So the Journal of the American Medical Association published research that estimated five additional deaths per 1,000 patients occurred in hospitals that routinely staff with a one to eight nurse to patient ratio compared to those staffing with a one to four nurse to patient ratio. And the, and the odds of patient death increased by 7% for each additional patient the nurse must care for at one time. So as a legislator, I am tasked with the responsibility of weighing in on the state budget. We spent the beginning of this year fighting back cuts to Medicaid funding. And because CMS reimbursement is tied to patient outcomes and satisfaction scores, safe staffing makes fiscal sense. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has found that hospitals with lower nurse staffing levels have higher rates of pneumonia, shock, cardiac arrest, urinary tract infections, and upper GI bleed bleeds, leading to higher cost and mortality from hospital-acquired complications. Research shows that better staffing policies not only result in better patient outcomes, but also lower the operating cost of healthcare providers by A, reducing the recruitment and training expenses resulting from staff burnout and turnover, B, lowering the penalties and reduced reimbursements imposed to, pe to penalize poor patient outcomes and unnecessary readmissions, C, lowering patient length of stay, D, reducing legal and mal malpractice costs, E, lowering staff productivity due to workplace injuries and fatigue, and F, lowering patient satisfaction scores and patient hospital quality ratings. So safe staffing is the single most important thing we can do to ensure the safety and care of every patient in our state. There is no technology that can help us further improve patient outcomes without addressing staffing. Dr. Danielle Ofri stated in a New York Times article just last week, corporate medicine has milked just about all the efficiency it can out of the system. With mergers and streamlining, it has pushed the productivity numbers about as far as they can go. Healthcare is not an assembly line. We need, to do, we need to put the bodies in place to do the work of taking care of our loved ones because we have to remember that at any given time, that patient could be our mother, our father, our children, or us. And I support the Resolution 396 with the amendments that my colleagues have uh, suggested. And I'm here to, of course, show their support of that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for, and for everything you've done in Albany this Thanks. past session. Um, it's been rough. <laughs> it's, I mean, it must be, all right, awesome to have a nurse in the assembly. It is. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Everything is about staffing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I thank you so much for your time. I, I mean, to have that direct report of, of being on the ground and knowing what it's like and, and to your colleague's point of, of having, this is a fight that has been ongoing that we're just trying to make common sense of when we all know healthcare is a human right and we, as a model city, we deserve to better outcomes. So thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Ari Moma. I've been, a, a work, I've been working as a registered nurse in the Department of Psychiatry at Interfaith Medical Center in Brooklyn for 23 years. Thanks to the chair, Councilman um, Rivera, for highlighting this very important issue. 
I'm here to testify in support of an amendment resolution 396 and support of Bill 1352. Interfaith Medical Center is situated in Best High in central Brooklyn, and it is one of the safe net hospitals caring for vulnerable New Yorkers. Um, if I might digress a little bit, a safe a safe net hospital is a type of medical center in U.S. by legal obligation or mission to provide health care for individuals regardless of their insurance status or ability to pay. Apart from the city hospitals, Interfaith is the largest psychiatric hospital in central Brooklyn. According to a report on health disparity in New York City published by the NYC Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, mental health problems are generally more common among the poor in Brooklyn. Furthermore, in a community health profile of 2018, the rate of psychiatric hospitalization in Best High is higher than the city rate, boasting 1,002 per 100,000 um, adults compared to the city average of 676. This reflects the challenges residents in the under-resourced neighborhood face, including difficulty accessing preventive services and early care, greater exposure that, that in danger of greater exposure to stressors and interruption in the health care. And more also, they are two to six times more likely to experience serious emotional stress than those with the highest income. My honorable council member, do you know where they go when um, where they go to seek their oh, to seek their illness after this uh, the illness become exacerbated, if they they head to the emergency room. The safe staffing for quality care ensures that all acute care facilities and nursing homes meet minimum safe staffing ratio and standards for nurses and other direct care. This would greatly impact our emergency department, where many of our patients' population are forced to wait for a bed to become available, where they also go to seek their, their first care because they couldn't afford to go to other, um, um, or, 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 um, to see their doctors, private doctors. When, psychi when psychiatric patients are forced to wait in emergency room, it becomes unimaginable. Many patients have behaviors related to their mental illness, which expands in a wide spectrum. With credit ED, long waiting time and limited staffers to attend to those patients and give them appropriate attention, it becomes a daunting situation and a safety concern for nurses and direct care providers. Believe me, I'm speaking from experience of 23 years. I support Bill 1352 for a local law in relation to conducting a study by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on the cases of rising wait times in emergency room. I believe the shortage on staffing has an impact on wait time. In 2004, California passed their staffing law, which requires hospitals to institute minimum nursing to, to patient ratios, where studies have shown that nurses in California have reported improved patient care outcomes and lower work, workplace injury rates. Workplace injury on a psychiatric unit are more common and enhance the issue of um, nurse shortage. We need appropriate uh, staffing level for all direct care staff to ensure the safety of everyone on the psychiatric unit. Our patient population need and deserve this addition. What I spend my what I spend my time doing for my patient differ depend on staffing levels. We are usually short staffed, and it is our patients that suffer. We are unable to give them time and attention to detail what they require. Please. I'm speaking from dealing with this patient firsthand. The man is a terrible thing to lose, and as nurses, we have taken oath to protect and advocate for them. It's burdensome, stressful, and guilt feeling when you couldn't give the patient the care he or she deserves because of shortage of staff. It is agonizing when you gave your best, but it wasn't enough because you couldn't get to the 10th or the 20th patient. Please, I support and encourage the implement of an amended version of Solution 396, which includes all direct care staff ratios. Thank you. Thank you for, for mentioning our psychiatric patients, and I know behavioral health has been a very, very big issue 
Um, and unfortunately, so many of these patients are end up in the emergency room when they need so much more focused care and attention. Um, and just so, as a friendly reminder, everyone, we want to just stay close to the clock so we could get through all of the testimony. So, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Julissa Saud, and I'm an adult geriatric nurse practitioner. I have been working with NYC H&H &H for 16 years. 11 of those years have been spent in a pediatric department, specifically ambulatory care and Elmhurst Hospital. Thank you, Chair Carolina Rivera, as well as Council Members Cabrera and San Monica for today's hearing on their important work on this issue that greatly impacts New York City patients. I am testifying in support of an amended resolution 396 in support of resolution 723. When I worked as a pediatric nurse caring for our most vulnerable patients, our patients ranged from seven days old to 17 years old. They all had different needs and concerns related to health. Working in the clinic, our primary goal is prevention. You wanna prevent those hospitalizations of these patients. Being that, you need time to educate patients. You need time to give vaccinations. You need time for those patients who walk in for a regular clinic visit but need an asthma treatment. Um, however, our patient load was so great due to short staffing, we would have 20 to 24 patients to see in a seven hour shift. Um, so therefore, our time to educate patients from 30 minutes went down to 15 minutes or less. So that left that newborn mother with, with um, problems breastfeeding with questions that patient that maybe needed a helmet to prevent a head injury without a helmet. These are pro pro services that some of our H&H &H, um, facilities provide pre for prevention, but due to short staffing, we weren't able. Alongside us worked our nurses in the pediatric ED. Um, they would see 12 to 13 patients per shift. In peak seasons, they would see more. So guess what? Those patients were diverted to the clinic. We would have to set up a triage area in a clinic to triage those patients. But due to short staffing and patient, if those patients had to be admitted, they would wait an hour, an hour and a half in our busy clinic. So along with the patient having 20 to 24 patients, she would now also have to observe that patient that had to wait to be admitted into the unit due to short staffing. <clears throat> The Safe Staffing for Quality Care Act ensures that acute care facilities and nursing homes meet appropriate minimum, minimum staffing ratios for nurses and direct care staff, and that the New York City Council commits to pursuing the implementation of minimum safe staffing ratios and standards in New NYC health and hospital system and all of our acute care hospitals and nursing homes that receive funding from or contract to provide patient care services for the City of New York. Safe staffing gives new parents time for education, gives time to, for them to, to learn how to care for their sick children. Babies who cannot speak or advocate for their own needs can, lead, can prevent death and illnesses related to, related to education and prevention. We are not begging for money. We are begging to save lives. We are begging for the opportunity to go home and feel like we did a good job by our patients and not have to worry if we forgot anything. There will always be excuses for short staffing, but I guarantee you those who oppose safe staffing minimums have never walked a mile or me and my colleagues' shoes in NYC H&H. &H. That's why I strongly support and encourage the implementation of an amended version of Resolution 396, which includes all direct care staff ratios. I also support Resolution 723. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Elysia McMyers. Thank you, committee chair, woman Rivera, as well as council members Cabrera and Salmanca for your work on resolution 396. I'm testifying in support, in support of resolution 396 with amendments. For the past 27 years, I've worked as a registered professional nurse. 22 of those 27 have been spent at H&H &H Harlem. I've risen through the ranks from staff nurse, nursing supervisor, and now accountable care manager. My background is specifically critical care and emergency services. I've been on the front line as a direct care provider. I'm knowledgeable about the challenges that many direct care RNs face. But specifically now, I'm also the NYSNA LBU member chairperson for all the new nurses at H&H &H Harlem. So I have the distinct privilege of welcoming them, orientating them, to be in a newly hired RN as an NYSNA member. I tell them about the advantages of being an H&H &H nurse. I tell them that their experience will take them anywhere. I also tell them that this line of work is a labor of love, but it can be re extremely rewarding. I just want to relay a little story about a specific unit. Our cardiac care unit is a six-bed critical care unit. It's utilized for patients with severe heart conditions, they require continu continuous heart 
and rhythm monitoring. Some patients have breathing tubes and they're on breathing machines for them. Um, most patients require complex medications to control or regulate their blood pressure or blood sugar, which can only be given through an IV pump while being monitored continuously. There are times when patients have critical procedures, like Ambo Bovey mentioned, being performed hourly, such as filtering their blood or urine, or cooling down their body after their heart has stopped and they've been revived successfully. Critical care patients are admitted into critical care units because they need intensive care and monitoring. They're not just bodies. In the same cardiac unit, within the past year, we've had three new RNs hired. After four months, one came to me with expressed concern about staffing and working short. She resigned. What could I say to her? I try to tell nurses that we're striving for better outcomes. The second nurse came to me four months after the first and stated that she too was going to resign. She expressed concerns about working from 7.30 to 9 and being unable to document properly because she's staying till 10 o'clock. She expressed her frustrations openly as a person who's taking care of possibly one to three patients in a 12-hour shift or four to five if you're working nights. I convinced her to stay for another month, but after a while she too was overwhelmed, underappreciated and too stressed to continue this pattern, she resigned as well. I orient members to the facility as a new member. I speak to seasoned members also, and have heard many nurses talk about how difficult it has become to provide the quality of care our patients deserve. They're tired of working short. They're tired of working alone in 11.5 hours without having a meal break or a bathroom break. And I tell them, it will get better. It's truly a labor of love, but now, we need the city of New York to express that labor of love to our nurses, direct care professionals, and patients that we care for. Safe staffing saves lives, and that's why I support and encourage the implementation of the amended version of Resolution 396, which includes nurses and all direct care staff. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Carolyn Esposito. I'm a registered nurse. I'm a former defense malpractice attorney. I'm an educator. Uh, I'm currently employed as the director of nursing education and nursing research at the New York State Nurses Association. And in that role, I conduct independent studies into the RN staffing levels at the 165 hospitals and nursing homes that we represent for collective bargaining. NISNA's overarching finding is that only 2% of the facilities currently meet the proposed staffing requirements that are advocated in the Safe Staffing for Quality Care Act, and only 4% of them meet our contractually agreed to nurse-to-patient ratios. NISNA has found that um, through its POA review, its negotiations, and its independent studies, and I say this, I say this from an ethical perspective, from my personal ethical perspective, that our healthcare facilities are consistently, deliberately, and conscientiously understaffing their patient units. They're refraining from filling budgeted positions, and they are routinely posting schedules with known holes in those schedules. The relationship between staffing levels and patient outcomes have been studied empirically for over 25 years. And there's a plethora of research findings and even a study by the CMS that shows increasing negative patient outcomes associated with lower RN staffing levels. Now, I'm not going to repeat testimony. A lot of it has been given. I do refer to you to the testimony that I submitted. What I'd like to talk to you about now are those protests of assignment that I review on behalf of the nurses uh, and, and the hospitals that we represent. Uh, we just concluded studying the private sector hospitals and you know, with all due respect to Dr. Katz, the critical care areas are not the number one area that nurses are filing protests over. It's the med surge units. 
and I am a former med surge nurse. So I know what the, what the work is like and how difficult it is. NISNA gets about 30,000 protests of assignment a year. Each protest of assignment is signed by four to six nurses. So you do the mathematics there. We consider that each signature is a separate protest of assignment. So we have tens of thousands of nurses who are complaining about the quality of their uh, nursing environment. And they're begging for the Safe Staffing for Quality Care Act to be passed in order to help them do the job that they are ethically and legally required to do. Nurses are vanguards of patients' safety and patient care. And without this minimum staffing that's in our, uh, our bill, nurses are not able to perform the function that they are, again, ethically, legally, socially required to do. Thank you, Dr. Esposito. I'm glad that you mentioned the protests I, I have met with nurses who have told me about the protests. It's kind of like a, a common piece of paper they now give in. They don't feel the process itself is taken with the seriousness of which that documentation actually implicits. Um, I wanted to ask, are there specific departments where setting a specific nurse to patient ratio is the most critical? Now, what I appreciate about this panel is the diversity in the field, right? We've heard from pediatrics and oncology and psychiatrics. So is there one particular, I don't want to say one, I'm not trying to limit it, but are there specific uh, departments where it's, it has to happen? It's, it's, it's really, really critical. You mentioned med, med surge. Med surge. Um, I, I'm, look, the reality is every specialty nursing care unit needs the ratios, every one. But what I see consistently in the protests of assignment is that the number one units that submit the most protests of assignment are the med surge, the critical care units, the emergency department, telemetry, step down, and psychiatry. Now, they vary in order. But I would say, generally speaking, med surge is the number one area okay. where nurses are crying out. Thank you. I appreciate that. It really, it really does mean a lot when you can get detailed and nuance, and it just has a lot to your experience and what you're dealing with on a, on a daily level. And thank you for um, your experience and, and what you're doing now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you for your time. With that, I'm going to call up the next panel, uh, Lorraine Bryan from Greater New York. Migna Taveras from Archcare and Scott Amhine Amhine from Continuing Care Leadership Coalition. I believe it was Oh, my colleague has it. Not sure if this is on. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Shall I begin? Yes. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Rivera and Council members who are still here. Um, thank you so much for spending the time that you have and, and your really tremendous questions throughout the afternoon. My name is Lorraine Ryan. I'm a senior vice president of the Greater New York Hospital Association. Our members include every hospital in, in New York City as well as hospitals across the state and in New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Um, as I just thank you, I will thank you again for the opportunity to speak at this hearing today. Um, New York's hospitals, Greater New York and I as a nurse, have the deepest respect and admiration for our registered nurses. And you might find this surprising, but we support more nurses. <laughs> uh, and we understand the need for more nurses uh, to ensure that our patients get the absolute best care that they possibly can. Uh, what we do not support, however, is the forced and flexible nature of the staffing ratios bill that has been put before the state legislature um, for the last several years. 
Um, and I just want to correct one point that the bill that has been entertained in, in Albany um, is, a, is a bit more severe than what California actually did pass, specifically in the area of med surge. Uh, California passed a bill that allowed for one to five ratio, and the New York bill calls for a one to four ratio. Um, so the bill is what we oppose. We do not oppose more nurses. My responsibilities at Greater New York include oversight um, of our clinical quality improvement initiatives and programming, and I can say without reservation that our hospitals are deeply committed to doing the best they possibly can and to constantly improve. We understand very well where we need to improve, and there are initiatives underway that are devoted to that level of improvement in a multidisciplinary manner, however. No two hospitals are exactly the same, and no single staffing formula at all times works in every situation. Legislating manding such belies the proven ability of hospitals and unions to agree on staffing plans on their own through good faith negotiations, as was done recently in New York City um, with NISNA. Again, I have to reinforce it. It's the inflexible nature of the bill. Yes, you can add more nurses, but you cannot add more patients. And when you have three patients waiting to go home on a med surge unit and one patient that is staying and you get three admissions, that nurse cannot take those admissions. And I think it needs to be well understood that acuity and census is an imperative ingredient to a safe staffing plan. That is not considered in the bill. Forced nurse staffing ratios, and we've heard this earlier today, would crowd out essential members of the healthcare team, undermine real-time patient care decisions, and again, deny hospitals and leadership, as well as unit-based nurses who participate in professional practice committees, the flexibility they, that they need, both to plan for staffing needs and to respond to emergencies. Healthcare delivery has never been more complex. We've heard that today over and over again. And we have learned that the only way to ensure optimal outcomes of care is through a multidisciplinary team approach. Not only nurses and physicians, but physical therapists, dietitians, pharmacists, transporters, and go, I go, could go on and on, but I won't. Mandatory ratios that need to be met at all times will prohibit the ability of this team to function as it should. I have a lot more to say um, since there's only three of us. Can I go on for a little bit longer? I'll give you a, a couple you of minutes. Wrap, wrap um, you know, the cost of the bill is prohibitive. I don't know if um, that's, you know, it, it's out there as a $3 billion annual uh, cost for hospitals and nursing homes, $2 billion for hospitals. Currently, the Department of Health, as you know, is studying the impact of, of, of what we need in healthcare today in New York, looking at the fiscal side as well as other initiatives and enhancements to staffing that will lead to better outcomes. Um, I can address some of those now or in my um, in the Q and A section. We've talked a little bit about quality care is a team sport these days. I hate to call it a sport because it's a very serious um, commitment that we make as clinicians and as healthcare providers. And there are studies that demonstrate improvement through the use of evidence-based practices that a multidisciplinary team implements. Um, I will reiterate that leaving staffing decisions to the experts with the input of unit-based nurses is essential. We want to hear the voice of the nurse who's taking care of these patients each and every day, who understands the challenges. Um, and again, the negotiations with NISNA have been so successful in getting more, getting more actual nurses on the unit, um, filling vacant positions, hiring large numbers of incremental staff across um, those hospitals that have already negotiated and those that are currently underway um, based on census, implementing float pools. Uh, to respond to sick calls and unexpected absences, which you can't always anticipate or plan for, agreed to enforcement of staffing guidelines to address systematic failures and meeting those, in meeting those guidelines, use of a third-party mediator, and dispute resolution procedures when and if necessary. Um, these are all essential. These are important steps. It's it's tremendous, and I think we all applaud the efforts of uh, those who have successfully negotiated. Uh, I'm not going to play, you know, back and forth on all the studies. The studies go both ways. 
it is not absolutely clear and certain. California will tell you that themselves. Staffing has not improved care across the board in all settings. In fact, the president of the SEIU, United Health Workers West, says that his not improved care as recently as 2015, and that there is no reliable evidence that nurse staffing ratios will do that for you. The study that the Department of Health has been mandated to conduct is underway, and it's very important to look. You asked about best practices earlier in the day. There are lots of best practices we could talk about that will get us where we need to go, get everybody in this room where we need to go without fixed, um, inflexible ratios. What it would do to threaten other jobs other than nurses within the healthcare environment is, I think, very obvious, and we've spoken a bit about that today. Um, as far as ED wait times, I think it needs to be well understood that the at all times inflexible requirements of the legislation will increase wait times. You will not be able to get patients out of the emergency department because a nurse on a med surge unit cannot take one more patient under the law. That is, is not where we need to go. We've worked very hard in the last five years with support from the federal government to reduce um, ED admissions, if you will, patients being admitted from the ED and diverted to ambulatory care. We're taking better care of our patients in the settings where they need to be cared for. It was raised earlier by one of the other council members that patients only get sicker when they sit in emergency departments and are surrounded by patients who are actually sick when they're um, their issue may not actually require an inpatient setting. And finally, um, where is my final page? I don't know where it is. Yeah. Here it is. Um, we have rules that already exist. You mentioned them yourself earlier today. The New York State Regulations 405 require nursing leadership to staff to the appropriate number and type of personnel needed to ensure safety. There are federal accreditors that are deemed to go in on the behalf of CMS and they, they survey to the quality and level of staffing. Um, and there are also other requirements in New York State law requiring the disclosure of staffing plans to anyone who masks, and they're associated with quality outcomes. In conclusion, we believe that staffing levels are left best to the experts, experienced clinicians, and for these reasons and all those I've cited um, in my written testimony as well, um, we oppose the bill that has been entertained in Albany is now, and that is now being uh, discussed at this hearing today. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Rivera and members of the committee. It's an honor to be here. Good afternoon. I'm Migna Tavares, and I'm the Director of Business and Strategic Planning for Arch Care. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding our concerns regarding mandatory staffing ratios. Arch Care cares for people of all ages, faiths, where they are most comfortable and best able to receive it at home, in the community, and in nursing homes. As the continuing care community of the Archdiocese of New York, we see enhancing the lives of our elders and others who need extra help to stay healthy and live life to its fullest as more than just a job. To us, it's a privilege and our calling. We strive to provide the highest quality of service to our patients. It is in integral to everything we do, including how we staff our nursing homes. We have been able to provide five-star quality ac across many of our nursing homes and receive national recognition for our achievements. It's important to understand that within our nursing homes, there is a wide range of acuity levels, and in this context, acuity means some are sicker than others, more clinically complex, whereas some are completely stable. We have young people in our facilities that have no place else to go, but have minimal care needs. Housing is the real problem in their situation, not medical care. So, and you can't discharge someone onto the streets. So mandatory patient staffing ratios limits the flexibility needed to achieve high quality and distracts from patients who have higher medical needs. It would be a failed policy enactment to not consider these complexities. This required change called for within this resolution will negatively impact the provision of specialized care and therapies. The ecosystem of the type of facility needs to be properly assessed, considered, coupled with patient care needs, and balanced with the reality of financial resources to support the various needs and functions of the institution providing the care. Housekeeping, food services, various therapies, doctors, social workers, security guards, among other professional service providers are all roles that contribute to the overall patient health and are key members to promoting successful patient healing. Prescribing a mandatory staffing ratio fails to consider the clinical care team needed to support a patient towards healing. 
um, it will cost Arch Care upwards of $23 million to implement the proposed nursing staffing ratios, which will not be covered by the reimbursement rates we currently receive. This proposal would virtually ensure the complete privatization of the nursing home industry, despite the fact that studies have demonstrated that nonprofit nursing homes provide higher levels of quality. According to a Harvard study, when compared to privately commercially owned nursing homes, nonprofit nursing homes decrease hospitalizations by 9.5%, increase mo mobility improvement by 12.8%, and increase pain improvement by 19.9%. Similar, similar legislation in California's law excluded nursing homes. If enacted, this change would be a multi-million dollar unfunded mandate to nursing homes. Nursing homes already operate on very small margins and are currently monitored by New York State DOHMH and CMS. CMS recently modified their surveillance rating system for nursing homes. The updated policy holds operators accountable for staffing ratios. CMS requests that person request personal personnel and benefits data to be provided to them direct directly. The staffing information allows them to know how nursing homes are staffing their units. If staffing levels are not reached, CMS automatically reduces the facility's rating to one star. I think it would be prudent to allow CMS's rating system to take effect and to affect the outcomes that we're trying to achieve through this legislation. The proposed nursing nurse staffing ratio legislation is a one-size-fits-all prescription for nursing homes that will not best advance patient care and quality. This approach does not recognize the wide range of comp and complexity of patient needs. Our nursing homes provide um, skilled nursing care, physical and occupational therapy, medication, nutrition, mobility, and spiritual care. ArchCare is committed to providing all of this care and caring for the whole person. A funded mandate is one thing, but an unfunded mandate will potentially fail our most vulnerable New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could just try to stick to the two minutes. Is it, is it three? Is it two? Uh, whatever's up there. Very good. It seems, uh, yeah. So, indeed, Chairwoman Rivera, it's, uh, my name is Scott Amrein. I'm from the Continuing Care Leadership Coalition. I'm very um, pleased and grateful for the opportunity to testify. I'm going to try to certainly not read my testimony and sort of emphasize some of the points that um, Minya made. And Appreciate it. Th the, the first is, is, you know, they're a member of CCLC, and all of our members are, are very supported, uh, supportive of the goals, you know, the goals of achieving better care, the goals of achieving better jobs, a better job environment. Um, I think what we take issue with is the way of getting there. We heard the word standardization, and we believe in standardization, but what I think what we would support is more standardization of approach than the kind of standardization that says there's one specific number in all of these different organizations that can be applied reasonably and I think as you heard Mignia say um, you know the nursing you know my, my kind of point that I want to start with is the nursing homes in the city of New York and the state of New York are very diverse they have programs that range from wound care to bariatric care to IV therapy to ventilation we have services for people with Huntington's disease you know it's a very diverse community and to set one staff ratio for that widely diverse community I think everyone can appreciate why that doesn't make sense. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise that I, I think may not be that well known is that the agency that oversees nursing home quality really struggled with these issues. And in 2016, they did, for the first time in about 19 years, a whole new revamp of the regulatory structure of nursing homes. And in the proposed rule, and I encourage people to read it, they really raised the pros and the cons of fixed ratios versus alternative approaches. And they ultimately decided that fixed ratios were too inflexible for application in the nursing facility setting. And again, I won't read it, but there's language that, that basically says they do not necessarily agree that imposing such a requirement is the best way. Rather, the focus should be on the skill sets and the specific competencies of assigned staff to provide the nursing care or resident needs rather than a static number of staff or hours. What they ended up doing was implementing a new model of regulation nursing home staffing that requires a competency-based approach. So as, as was said, every nursing home has to assess the acuity of their residents, come up with a staffing plan, and then be evaluated on that plan. And that's part of the survey process. And the last thing I'll say, and I think it was alluded to, is, you know, I stay awake up at night, every night, worrying about the um, survival of high-quality not-for-profit nursing homes. We have nursing homes closing one every two months, and the nursing homes that are closing the most are the highest quality not-for-profit providers, and they simply aren't paid enough by the Medicaid system as it is to thrive. And if you impose a mandate that, as Lorraine indicated, is equal to a billion dollars a year for the nursing homes in New York State, you're going to see an 
acceleration of the closure of these high quality nursing homes, which is simply horrible for uh, has horrible implications for access to care and quality of care for people who need nursing home care. So we're prepared to work with you, um, and and certainly, you know, as, as Lorraine said, we believe more staffing is a good thing. It's just about the approach, and, and we do register our objection to both the resolution and the underlying legislation. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a question for Ms. Ryan. So you said there are alternative ways to establish safe staffing practices, but specifically, what, what are they? What are your recommendations? Well, as I, um, I listed all of the uh, agreed upon approaches that NISNA and the hospitals that have successfully negotiated ratified contracts this year, um, there are other ways to support nursing. And we've brought these, you know, many of our hospitals already do this, having wound care specialists, having a lift team so that it's not just up to the nurse to, to move a debilitated patient from bed to the chair or even to ambulate, having um, ICU trans or yeah, ICU transport support so you're not pulling the RN off the floor to move a patient who's on oxygen and um, a cardiac monitor that's going for a test somewhere else in the institution. Um, admitting and discharge support, uh, never has it been more important to ensure a safe discharge of a patient back into a community and to avoid a readmission for someone who's got a chronic illness. So the time that it takes for social work to spend with that patient and family. We have the CARE Act that passed in New York in 2016 that requires hospitals to spend time with the caregiver in the home, not always the son and daughter who might be at work, but the neighbor, the friend, who's going to actually help that patient take their medications and going through the medication regime, what are they for, what are the likely side effects, what kind of food and when should you eat food before and after medications. There, I could go on and on about the types of supports that we think could be more helpful. Clinical pharmacists on oncology units, so it's not up to the nurse to be concerned about the side effects and understanding when the best time to give a patient a certain med that is experiencing side effects, whether it's nausea, vomiting, or the inability to eat. So there are many other ways that we need to spend money on, but are much more um, will it be a much more efficient and holistic way, and, and not reduce and not increase fragmentation of care uh, to provide the best care possible for patients. And to Ms. Tavares and. Um Scott, can you tell me how to pronounce it? Sure, yeah. I, I saw you struggle, and, and everybody does. It's Amrine. So, Amrine. Uh, yes. So you're looking for an exclusion to four nursing homes as similar to what is in California's legislation? I mean, you know, we, we think for all the reasons that Lorraine mentioned that it's really inappropriate, whether it's for hospitals or nursing homes. What we think, and um, Minya, you said it in your testimony, we need to really give the ch a chance to the federal standard that was just created. It's only really just been put into effect in the last couple of years that requires nursing homes to define uh, you know, facility-specific um, staffing plans that are calibrated to the acuity of their patients and then to be assessed and, and surveyed on those and held accountable for those. And we think that's a very powerful model and we think it needs an opportunity to prove itself. Well, thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Appreciate you um, for being here, for waiting. Um, you get almost as much credit as the last panel who I want to thank for waiting to testify. Um, I, I really do appreciate you all hanging tough for the last two and a half hours. Uh, Jill Ferrillo from Nisna, Mark Hanne, if you're here, Metro New York. I didn't see Mark. Oh, okay. Uh, Mario Henry, great. Kevin Collins, Sheldon Fine, Mafazur Rahman, and Anthony Feliciano. Okay, cool. Thank you. Where's Mark? And where's Mark? Mark. There he is. <coughs> Gone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and I saw Mario, I saw Mark, I see Kevin, uh, Sheldon. <coughs> Sheldon. 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 S
Shelly had to leave. Shelly to leave? Okay. Tell him sorry. And you're Mr. Rahman? Yes. And there's a, I said Anthony's gone already. Okay, I guess I got everyone, right? All right. Take it away. Want to go first? Oh, no. It's working. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable uh, Chairwoman. My name is Mafuz Rahman, and I'm the Executive Vice Secretary on Community Board 11, as well as the Vice Chair on the Human Services Committee. I'm here today representing Community Board 11 in regards to safe nurse patient ratios at Mount Sinai Hospital. Uh, so more or less on February 19th, uh, the board uh, took a position in regards to an impeding strike. And I'm just gonna, for the testimony, read aloud uh, what we've uh, resolved on. Whereas Community Board 11 is aware that there is a danger of an impeding strike of the nurses at Mount Sinai Hospitals, which we understood would have a devastating impact on our community, whereas in cur current contract negotiations between Mount Sinai and New York State Nurse Association, the two sides have not agreed on st staff levels per unit, particularly the number of registered nurses per patient, where it has been reported by the representatives of the nurses that the hospital has not complied with the previous contract guidelines, whereas moreover, academic and specialty nurse associations recommend North nurse patient safe ratios for example, one registered nurse per three patients in the emergency room is considered a safe ratio, and whereas the registered nurses at Mount Sinai of Hospitals report ratios of one registered nurse to seven patients in the emergency room, a differential that, if confirmed, is alarming. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that Community Board 11 urges the New York State Nurse Association and Mount Sinai to negotiate in good faith in order to agree in their collective bargaining agreement upon safe registered nurse to patient ratios in each unit of Mount Sinai hospitals that result in better patient outcomes and implores the leadership of both Mount Sinai and the union to make every effort to prevent a strike. Thank you uh, so much, Arnold. Thank you. I served on my community board too. Huh? Okay. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair, Chair Rivera. Thanks for holding this hearing today. Uh, my name is Mark Han. I am Director of Metro New York Healthcare for All. We're a citywide coalition of community groups and labor unions that advocates for universal health care and strategic steps toward that goal. The New York State Nurses Association is, has been long been a member of our coalition's steering committee. We strongly support the establishment of staffing ratios for nurses in all hospitals and nursing homes through legislation, regulation, and or negotiated contracts between employers and their unions, especially in our city's public hospital system and in other inpatient facilities in our city with whom the city government may contract. We're pleased to learn that the council is poised to support the Safe Staffing and Quality Care Act now before the New York State Legislature, and we support the council's adoption of Resolution 396 as introduced, uh, introduced by Council Member Cabrera. Our coalition's core mission is having city, state, and federal government either individually or collectively assure health care for all New Yorkers, ideally through a universal public program for all state residents. However, even once comprehensive insurance coverage is in place, that does not necessarily mean that needed services are available in the community, nor that quality services are provided. One of the key factors in assuring timely access to quality hospital care and appropriate levels is appropriate levels of clinical staff appropriate to a given department. Proper staffing also saves money for our overall health care system and prevents additional and unnecessary morbidity and mortality for individual patients, additional stress and burdens on informal family caregivers, and protects the public's health. While the oversight of our city's hospitals and nursing homes primarily lies with state government, local government also has a leadership role to play. It can set proper standards for our city's public hospitals and use them as prime example that the standards proposed by the Safe Staffing and Quality Care Act are indeed feasible, economic, and effective. 
Further, it can require all health care facilities it contracts with to adhere to the bill's standards, since not all New Yorkers receive services solely within our public hospital system. Thanks for the opportunity to comment, and we thank you for your leadership on the council and the committee for taking up this issue. And I've written copies. I'm not sure what to do, Luke, but hand them over there. Okay. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. Chairman Rivera, members of the Committee on Hospitals, Council Members, my name is Mario C. Henry. I am a senior citizen, a member of New York Statewide Senior Action Council, and for these reasons, a supporter of amending Resolution 396. Senior citizens, by the very nature of their age, spend more time in medical facilities. Seniors consume two-thirds of all health care services provided, making them statistically more vulnerable to the adverse effects of not having proper care in hospitals and nursing homes. Seniors are at a greater risk for more frequent and more severe adverse reactions to medications. Seniors are at a greater risk of contracting pneumonia. Seniors are at a greater risk of getting pressure sores. Seniors are at a, gre they are at a greater risk of falls and fractured bones. They, more than any other age group, need adequate numbers of nurses present to monitor their conditions and alert physicians' assistants and doctors to problems in a timely fashion. The periodic visit by a doctor or, by a doctor or physician's assistant will not be enough to assure a timely response to an unanticipated change in a medical condition. By the time the doctor or physician's assistant sees the problem, the, pe the senior might very well be dead. Nurses are the first line of defense for patients and sometimes the difference between life and death. Senior citizens have a right to know that in their so-called golden years, they will receive proper care in a timely manner. Seniors have a right to know that when they are most vulnerable, they will not be neglected. The New York State Nurses Association has shown, based on publicly available documents, that the additional cost of adequately staffing medical facilities is not prohibitive. The cost of adequately staffing would be only one and a quarter percent of the total revenues of the New York State hospitals and only six and a quarter percent of the money hospitals spend on non-patient care. I do not think citizens, when the senior citizens, when they are, are most vulnerable, I do not think that it's too much to ask to avoid neglecting our senior citizens when they are most vulnerable. That concludes my statement. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Kevin Collins, the Executive Director of Doctors Council SCIU, and thank you, uh, Chair, Councilmember Rivera, and all the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify here today. We represent thousands of doctors in the metropolitan area, including in every New York City Health and Hospitals facility, the Department of Health, Correctional Facilities, and other city agencies. As a healthcare union of physicians, we support the amended resolution number 396 endorsing state enactment of the Safe Staffing for Quality Care Act. Quite simply, doctors care for patients for a number of reasons, including to make them better through treating an illness and to manage a chronic condition. The best way to do this is with the proper staffing of all the members of the patient care team, especially nurses. Doctors follow the adage of do no harm. The best way to avoid this is by not being short-staffed. Our doctors see every day how nursing care is critical to the delivery of quality and safe patient care. Having enough nurses to provide that care is vital. Safe staffing saves lives. The Journal of American Medical Association, JAMA, published research that estimated five additional deaths per 1,000 patients occur in hospitals routinely staffed with a 1 to 8 uh, ratio as compared to those with a 1 to 4 ratio, and that the odds of a patient uh, death increased by 7% for each additional patient that the nurse must care for at one time. Safe staffing improves patient outcomes. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the inadequacy of nurse and other direct care staffing levels leads to poor patient outcomes and workplace injury rates. According to another report published by Health Services Research, nursing homes which have safe staffing ratios have better quality of care in their facilities and improved functional status of the residents. If we put the patient at the center of making our health care policy decisions, then surely we would put safe staffing of nurses at the top of any list to make sure that patients receive the best possible care and that the patient experience and satisfaction is as best as can be. That should be our guiding light, putting the patient at the center of our decisions. With a properly staffed department or division, we can have better patient outcomes, reduced unnecessary readmissions, less nursing turnover and burnout, lower patient stay, and reduce legal costs. 
It's been found that hospitals with lower nursing staffing levels have higher uh, incidence rates of pneumonia and other uh, medical uh, aspects as well. We also agree in calling upon the City of New York to consider pursuing similar legislation with the health and hospitals. I will point out this, that uh, we're about to enter into bargaining. So we've done a lot of conversations with all the doctors throughout the city hospital system as well as surveys. And it asks, what would you like to see to help improve patient care? What are the barriers to good care? And over and over and over again, the response comes back. We want to have more staff and especially more staffing of nurses. And that's the doctor's perspective, that having more staffing of nurses will lead to better patient care outcomes and a better patient experience, both for the patients and for the family members. The rest of my comments you can read in the testimony that I've submitted, and I thank you for your time. Good afternoon, I'm Jill Farello. I'm the Executive Director of the New York State Nurses Association, and I'm here primarily to um, testify to the actual facts of what uh, safe staffing has done in California as well as um, what the actual uh, situation is, is here in New York. And I'm reading through the testimony provided by the Greater New York Hospital Association um, where it says that forced nurse staffing ratios would crowd out other essential members of the health care team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to quote the whole paragraph, only to say that that just is not true and did not happen in California. Um, all of the studies show that um, there has been an actual increase in the total numbers of people who are non-RNs who are caring for patients in California hospitals right now. Those are the facts, and the studies show that. Um, the um, uh, the issue about forced nurse staffing ratios would cut, um, I'm sorry, they would cost New York hospitals and nursing homes billions and billions of dollars. Uh, these same things were said in California in much of the testimony provided uh, in the lead up to the, pa the successful passage of the Safe Staffing Act in California. And in fact, hospitals made more money in the 10 years following the ap actual implementation of the nurse staffing ratios than they made into the prior 10 years to the passage of that legislation and the implementation of that legislation. They made billions and billions of dollars. There are two people that have been in this room today that actually were on the ground when staffing ratios were implemented in California. One has, is not here right now, but I do know him well. His name is Dr. Mitchell Katz. He's the CEO of the H&H &H system. Um, I was there as well. I was the Director of Government Relations for the California Nurses Association, and both of us experienced uh, when, the imp the, when the California ratios were implemented, we saw that, number one, safe staffing ratios saved lives. There were better outcomes for all patients involved. All of the indicators that you would look at have been studied and studied and studied and have shown that patients do better with the implementation of these ratios. Uh, the second thing that we found, again, as I will state again, is that hospitals did better. As a matter of fact, under Dr. Katz's leadership in the public health systems in California, both in San Francisco and in Los Angeles, they maximized um, what they could do with these ratios, and as a result, those two systems brought in more dollars throughout the years when Dr. Katz was there. And one of the ways that they were able to bring in those dollars had to do with the staffing improvements. People stayed in that system. They were given the option under Obamacare, if you recall, to perhaps move out of the system, but people in the public system didn't leave. They stayed, and they received excellent care in the county health departments as a result of safe staffing implemented in 2004 in California. So it brought the revenues necessary to save those public health systems that were suffering some of the very same ills that we're suffering right now in this state. Which brings us to another myth, which is that um, the uh, nursing homes, uh, that, there's, that the nursing homes were excluded in uh, legislation in California. No, the nursing homes ab actually were not excluded. The nursing homes um, passed legislation the year, the year after the legislation was passed for hospitals and did implement a system of safe staffing in the nursing homes. So um, that, you know, just, for, just to be factual, 
they did uh, do these reforms. It was based on an hours per patient care model, which is very similar, to, and it is a methodology that's similar to a ratio system. Um, the issue of uh, the problems about uh, the ED wait times, the access to care, um, these kind of things, that's already happening in the hospitals. You can ask any of these nurses right now about what is going on in the emergency rooms, about the ED wait times. You can speak to the nurses about what is happening on the floors in our H&H hospitals. They did testify the other day when we opened up negotiations. And the reality is, is that the things that the Greater New York Hospital Association is talking about that these will happen. No, no, it's not that they will happen, it's that they're already happening. And the implementation of safe staffing is the cure for that. The um, Greater New York Hospital- have, We did have a number of nurses testify. Exactly. And, and, and they were um, personal and they included a number of stories from many of the nurses who are in different departments as well. It was very diverse, so I wanna thank you for for organizing, for being being fabulous organizers, of course, and to the advocates as well. I just wanted to ask you to, to wrap up if there was yes, a, yeah, a last I'm, thought. Yeah, I just was going to finish and say that the Greater New York Hospital Association and all of these associations that don't want regulations um, are, they're just missing the point, which is that a highly regulated environment is absolutely necessary when you're talking about patients' lives. We are talking about safety regulations. I mean, we wouldn't say that to the airline industry. We wouldn't say that to any other industry where patient, where people's lives are in uh, the hands of, of a workforce. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that the private hospitals have not done due diligence to uh, supporting this system, our H&H &H system. And um, as a matter of fact, we should be looking at some of the recommendations that have come out of a recent paper that was issued um, by uh, two authors who've studied the H&H &H system, that we actually need more regulations and we need these hospital systems to actually um, pay their fair share and that they should be supporting our public health system in a better way so that we can have the safe staffing that's absolutely essential in this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. I, I want to just thank everyone from the community board and, and longtime advocate for universal health care and, of course, to the Doctors Council. Thank you for bringing the doctor's perspective. I think that's so important because the nurses are there to take care of the patients first and foremost, but they are the front line to support the doctors. And, um, of course, making sure that we're all taken care of throughout every stage of our life. So I want to thank you. I know that we have a lot of work to do, and I hope that we can do it uh, together. I know that I hope you all consider me an ally. And for everyone here that testified as to alternatives or to possible remedies or ways around this legislation, I think that by the experiences that were shared today, the stories that you heard, standardization does seem to be a common theme. Um, but when you have someone who has 15 patients at a time, that is a disservice to the people of New York City. And that should be in no way standard in any part of this country. So I want to thank everyone. You all are incredible. Thank you for your time. I don't see any more members of the public who wish to testify. And with that, I'm going to adjourn this hearing. Thank you. Good to see you tomorrow. Yeah, of course, the Puerto Rico. It's almost, I was going to tell you. I was going to thank you for your work around Puerto Rico. I'm like, Carlina. Stay on topic. Oh, this